by um, you know, deed restrictions or whatever, uh, so that you can take advantage of this. So uh, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for any neighborhood in the city uh, to take advantage of. So with that, a uh, couple of cents. Um, mo motion's been made and seconded to approve. Seeing no other, other requests for discussion, let's vote on the board. And that motion is approved 6-0. Next order of business, public hearings. 6A, and that is hold a public hearing and consider adoption of an ordinance of the City of Denton amending Chapter 35.22 of the Denton Development Code relating to gas well drilling and production with definitions and related provisions. Thank you, Mayor. I'm going to ask Darren Groth, our gas well administrator, if he would make the initial presentation on this public hearing uh, before you open it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mayor, members of the Council, uh, this will be a presentation for the public hearing of DCA 12-5. That's a development code amendment uh, from 2012. It's the fifth one we had for subchapter 22, which is the gas drilling and production regulations. Uh, as I stand here before you today, one of the things I could do is at least show you how we got to this point. Uh, during this phase two regulation, we've had 16 task force meetings. We've had three planning and zoning commission meetings, six process updates in front of this body, uh, public input meeting on December 4th by the city council. And we've also had a previous public hearing on December 18th. Uh, at each of those meetings, we gathered input as staff, looked to rewrite the ordinance, made changes, uh, considered the input, and what that got us now is that tonight's ordinance, as was presented to you, is the fifth version. There's been some discussion. We made some changes to that. But if I could at least go through the, the next five slides, it'll show nine items that were changed from what you saw on December 18th. Uh, these numbers are, are going to show what we modified based on input that night. So the first one is the definition of habitable structure. Uh, you'll see in the sen second sentence, uh, the reference to mobile homes is deleted uh, since it is a habitable structure and is included in the term dwelling in subchapter 23 of the Denton Development Code. That's our definitions chapter. A couple other changes uh, as far as definitions. The definition of protected use includes hotel and motel. Under section 3522.5A1, uh, the section of D was deleted and the rest of the sections were obviously relettered after that in, in, in accordance with making that change. Uh, under section 3522.5A6 and the term saltwater disposal wells uh, was revised to class two injection wells. That's more consistent with the state regulations. Uh, class two injection well is, is for oil and gas waste. There's five different classes. This one deals with oil and gas waste, not just a saltwater disposal well, it's more all-inclusive. Uh, under section 3522.16A1, uh, the fifth line before the word criteria, minor change, but the word uh, relevant was inserted. <coughs> Another change to section 3522.16A1B is that after the heading standard of review for variances, uh, the following sentence was inserted. It says, in deciding variance requests, the Board of Adjustment shall, shall consider where applicable the following criteria. And it went on to uh, identify what those criteria will be. So you can see the next two changes were, were just adding, getting ready to add the next provision. So there was a semicolon and, and the word and actually added to get us to uh, section 35.22.16.A1B. Uh, a new subsection was added, XII. And it is going to lay out the Zoning Board of Adjustments process to hear a variance to the setback standards. And it says when a, where a variance is requested to reduce separation standards in 3522.5A1. That's our setback distance. Uh, so what criteria is the ZBA going to look at to make that determination? That was changed in, in the ordinance that was presented to you. There was some discussion this evening. We'll get uh, hard copies to include those changes. But there are four additional changes that, that you'll see. Uh, we can bring those forward once you get hard copies. They're actually being printed. Uh, if you have questions, I could bring those up now, but uh, what I could do is at least explain how the definition of compressor station was updated. It'll read that it's a facility that compresses natural gas for delivery through a transmission pipeline. 
that's a, that's a new definition based off of conversations this evening uh, that won't be in this presentation, but we'll make that change as well. Uh, section 3522.5A1F, uh, that's uh, separation standards of this section applied to sites containing a compressor station. So not only was the definition of compressor stations added, also uh, separation standards included uh, for that site. In addition, the noise management standards in Section C also apply to compressor stations. And then reworking is a, is a new definition. It was actually updated to include wells, uh, whether they're producing or not. And then the notices for reworking and other activities will go out to the city and the public uh, 48 hours in advance of the action. So those are four additional changes that you'll see aren't on the presentation, but we'll get those included. So 13 differences since the uh, December 18th meeting. Some of those changes were done at the direction of council's discussion, but in addition to other input areas, we've seen that uh, the Denton Stakeholders Drilling Advisory Group uh, expressed some concerns, our neighborhood group, uh, a coalition of concerned citizens. They presented a 16 bullet point idea list of, of areas in addition to what was already being considered with all those public meeting input points uh, of ideas to look at in this fifth draft. In order to address those concerns, uh, city staff met with a DAG representative on January 7th. Each concern was discussed in detail. I don't know if the concerns were fully satisfied. I, I would assume they weren't because the opportunity to discuss with the DAG group was, was really an information sharing exercise. DAG had a lot of good input, uh, so did a lot of the uh, citizens, a lot of the industry reps, uh, a lot of the task force members. During that entire process, we've had a lot of input received. So this was an opportunity to share some feedback back to the community, back to DAG specifically, as to how their points of, of interest were being addressed in the ordinance. So not only was that sent out to DAG, uh, but the replies were also posted on the city's website uh, last week. So hopefully anybody with similar questions would be able to get the, the response. And again, it's a information for what the uh, ordinance process is, not necessarily anybody's point of view, but at least shares how we got to this point. Uh, with that said, I, I can stand for any questions. I don't have any other uh, information to present, however. Councilmember Gregory has a question. Thank you. Um, there have been some suggestions made that we include in our ordinance provisions that are very similar to um, the rules that the EPA has adopted uh, in phase two of their, their air quality program and it's called green completions and um, it goes into effect January 1 of 2015. And I believe that the council has asked that, that we include those provisions that are in the current, that are scheduled by the EPA to go into effect in 2015 in this ordinance. Could you talk a little bit about what, what green completion means, what it's attempting to accomplish, and, and and then address whether or not it has been included in the ordinance that we are considering tonight. And, and if you don't mind, I'll take the last one first because the easy answer there is yes, it is included. Uh, going back to the initial question then, green completion is often a confusing term. It, it has a different definition depending on who's using it. If, if the standard were to vent a well, if you directed that vent to a flare, and instead of just emitting the gas and, and other constituents, if it were burned, it's cleaner than, from an atmospheric standpoint, it's cleaner than just venting. So in that instance, flaring would be a green completion. What the EPA is trying to regulate is more of a reduced emission completion. So instead of saying, go ahead and, and flare it, you're not capturing those emissions. So this is designed by the EPA to reduce the emissions as ways that won't result in venting and won't result in flaring. Those provisions, uh, nearly <laughs> verbatim, 
were actually inserted into the ordinance in various provisions. So it is included and it mimics what the federal regulation is going to do. So I just want to be clear, and I'm, I know I'm getting a little redundant with the question, but, but just, just to be clear, is this ordinance um, more restrictive than the EPA rules going into effect in 2015? It, it's not more completion. restrictive, no. It, okay. it mimics the language. Okay. So is it less restrictive than the green completions required by EPA? It's the same. That I Notice I'm being redundant. I'm just wanting to say it in a couple of different ways. It's not, it's not uh, more restrictive. It's not less restrictive. It is the same as the EPA rules. That's correct. Okay. Um, I'll let somebody else ask a question and then I may come back. Councilmember Watts. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Darren, you had mentioned the changes that had been discussed in the in the work session. And one that um, I, I'm not sure that we've had any feedback from the, to the city attorney yet, but on the issue of the well for injection wells, uh, I, I believe the suggestion was to change the well little w to a capital W, and we're going to make that change as well, and that's in section 3322.5 PI. And that's just to clarify that the flow back is not going to go into a salt water or uh, injection well. It's going back in to recycle a well. That's one of the, that's one of the options. And I guess, Mayor, a question I have is, um, you know, we talked about some options for air monitoring and water monitoring, and I, I'm not sure when would be the appropriate time to sort of just briefly describe that paradigm, whether it would be now or after or you know, before the public hearing or after the public hearing. I'd like to hear my colleagues sort of weigh in on I, that. I think, um, I think it would probably be most appropriate to identify that at this time so that we don't have public commentary on something that actually there's, an, uh, there's very definitive substantive information to disclose. So your series of questions could, could identify the, that, uh, that prospect. And, and that approach and the direction that uh, council has uh, generally given a work session, but will restate here. Okay, so if I yes. could interject, the, the first part, uh, what is P, as you mentioned? Right. It says, for the duration of flowback, recovered liquid shall be routed into one or more storage vessels. That's kind of a standard procedure on flowback. But then it says, or reinjected into the well. Once flowback ends, Oftentimes, a heavier weight water will be used to shut in the well. Again, that's, that's kind of standard. That isn't a disposal well, or another well could be used to help stimulate that well if they're in close proximity. Sure. So this language, even with the change, would have the same meaning as to what's customarily attributable to okay. operations that are, that are ongoing, and neither one of these would include a Class two injection well. Sure. Okay, good. As far as the alternatives for air and water monitoring, who's give a presentation on that right or, I mean or summarize yeah it or, could be Chris <laughs> well I, I mean, I'll, I'll go for it um, well one of the options that was discussed and, and madam city attorney if I approach any kind of information that uh, just get me with a hook or something um, in essence it seems like that two of the top priorities uh, from the public seem to be the air monitoring and the water monitoring, which is obviously a priority for the city council, the health and safety of our citizens. And, and one of the things we've struggled with is how do we do that effectively uh, and prudently? And I, Flower Mound, the way that it, Flower Mound's ordinance comes up a lot in the discussion in, in these public hearings and also just in discussions and emails that we've received from various constituents. Uh, what Flower Mound does is they uh, perform air monitoring through their oil inspection and monitoring department. Uh, therefore, they didn't have to include it in the ordinance and therefore um, they perform those services and that's just part of the cost of the department uh, which is recovered through, through the oil and gas fees. And we also talked about that on pr uh, well monitoring, uh, you have a challenge with private wells in that you have to obtain permission from the owner of the well in if order I might, to, yes. water wells. Water wells, yes, what did I say? Just wells. Oh, wa water wells, yes, water wells. Uh, that you have to obtain permission from the private water well owner in order to perform such tests and, and we could employ the same paradigm with the air monitoring and the water monitoring. The city can perform those, those tests, 
with whatever distance is that it ultimately is decided on the setback, the water wells that are within the setback prescribed in the ordinance. Uh, and that could be as part of the oil and gas well division. So we're able to do that without necessarily uh, placing them in our ordinance, which provides very distinct advantages to the city and to the citizenry in, in doing that. So that is a brief synopsis of that. Uh, and if certainly if, if any other of my colleagues have some comments on that, I certainly, I certainly welcome that. And you might follow on to say that the direction given by council to staff at the work session was to develop those uh, initiatives uh, through the uh, departmental, on a de departmental basis with the, the fees to be um, uh, spread out amongst any development of oil and gas you know, within the city limits uh, rather than defined under this particular ordinance. Well said. Uh, Council Member Roden. I did have a question uh, in terms of that direction and uh, do we have a sense, and perhaps it's too early to tell, and I guess this is a question for our, our attorney or perhaps staff, of how soon uh, we can be briefed on what precisely we can do in that arena uh, and how quickly we can begin implementing it. Well, I understand the direction from work session uh, would be to possibly use the consultant we did last time to set our fees. So it would require some sort of service to identify what the scope would be. If, if the testing were done by the division, you'd want to make sure that uh, it was Jay Stowe that did the analysis, that their new analysis includes all of those details. I wasn't here when they did the first one. I don't know how long that took, uh, but I think we definitely have to recognize whether or not they're available ensure that the scope included uh, what it was the council directed us to look at and then ask for them to see how long it would take. But based on that timeline, I think we'd get the information back to you. Yeah, I mean, I mean my recommendation is, is as quickly as possible that we can start analyzing uh, our options, how much it's going to cost, and begin that process of both the, the, the water well monitoring uh, and the air monitoring as quickly as possible. And I'll interject also that we're not recreating the wheel here. We, right. we have had such a study with, with a very definitive group that's a, aware of what we do up till this moment. And also Flower Mound uh, presumably undertook such a study you know, in, in their development process. So th this is not a completely new uh, approach. So um, Council Member Gregory. Thanks. So we've talked about some ways of addressing um, air monitoring and groundwater monitoring water wells uh, but we also talked uh, this afternoon with dr. banks about some of the things that the city is already doing with monitoring water quality of our surface water the runoff water that goes down the creeks into the lakes uh, could would it be possible to ask dr. banks to come to the podium and explain a little bit about that and then I have a question for him I'm more than welcome to relinquish my time to Dr. Banks. <laughs> I figured you would. Thank be. you. Yes, sir. Uh, would you kind of just go over what we're currently doing, how it works, the grid that you explained to us alert a little bit earlier? Right. We, um, we've had a monitoring program of surface water resources in Denton now going back to January of 2001. Uh, we perform monthly sampling on a grid network across our entire drainage infrastructure within the city of Denton on a, um, we've got now approximately 80 stations that we visit on a monthly basis. Would you repeat that number? Yes, 80 stations. Okay, thank you. And uh, those, those 80 stations are assessed as long as there is water in the stream. Uh, and we do a series of chemistry analyses. Uh, we've done other types of analyses on them as well, but we are out actively monitoring those sites on a monthly basis. And when you find something that is of concern in the water, what do you do? Uh, typically, we will try to figure out what the, uh, the source is. If, uh, if it's a parameter that we can measure with a meter, we literally can walk up the stream with that meter and try to determine where the source is. Okay. Um, are there some, um, you, you test for certain 
things. <laughs> I don't know what your technical term would be for it. What, what, what kinds of things do you test for when you're testing the water now? Um, we test for all kinds of standard water chemistry. We're looking at um, uh, conductivity, pH, dissolved oxygen, temperature. We do pesticide, herbicide analyses. Uh, we'll typically do water hardness uh, test, et cetera. So it's, it's fairly standard water chemistry, but I would, uh, I would state that you can find a, a lot of things out about a system using that standard chemistry simply because we've been doing it for so long. We know what the streams look like. We know what a deviation would be. If we were concerned about um, anything unique uh, that might enter into the streams and our lakes and our water system because of drilling, would there be any other kinds of tests that you might want to add to your regular protocol at those 80 stations? Well, um, we have dealt with issues of discharges to surface water resources before. Uh, looking back at our data and what we've been able to find through the years, actually measurements of conductivity have been pretty good at being able to determine discharges off of uh, sites like asphalt drilling sites simply because that almost always they're going to contain chloride contents. The ions in the water are going to be detectable by our conductivity meters, and that gives us a handheld meter that we can measure real time. We can leave it deployed in the stream and actually trace it upwards. Um, we have done some limited sampling on total petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, uh, BTEX, things of that nature. But uh, actually, in my opinion, the uh, conductivity testing has been a very uh, easy to use parameter that allows us to actually do real-time tracing up the stream if we need to. If, if you determine um, that there might be other appropriate tests that would, that would help us, especially in terms of, of um, concerns with, with pollution from well sites uh, that might add to the cost of the testing, I would hope that you would communicate that with, with the rest of the staff so that as we review our fee structure that, that we might incorporate those into the fees uh, uh, so, that, so that they're appropriately covered. One last question about the, those 80 well sites or 80 testing sites. Um, how does that compare with other cities uh, either in our size range in terms of population or area? In, in terms of population or area, I'm not aware of any city that's out there that does that much testing in terms of spatial distribution or uh, that often in time. Thank you. Sure. And Council Member Roden, do, um, is your question the same? No, so if someone else has a question of him, I'm, I'm turning to another topic. Any other questions of uh, Dr. Banks? Thanks. Okay. Now Council Member Roden. Thank you, Mayor. Question for Darren. I want to talk pits for a second. Uh, it remains a, a concern, and, and, and something you brought to my attention uh, a few weeks back was uh, helpful in this regard, at least in helping me understand and giving me a greater sense of comfort about what we're looking at. The gas well inspection team has the authority to inspect any sort of standing water on gas well sites. Is that correct? It, it and, is. And what it, is it that you are testing for specifically? It, it is. And, and looking at pits, you'll note the definitions include a lot of different pits. Uh, there will be a lot of different pits. But what we're looking for uh, specifically, there, there's standards as far as the, the water, uh, any testing in it, uh, looking at uh, the constituents of what is in the pit. Uh, we have in our ordinance different concentrations of TPH, as Dr. Banks mentioned, uh, BTEX, benzene, chloride contents, all of those will be measured. We set a standard as far as what the concentration could be, uh, but it, it doesn't necessarily pertain to a specific pit, right. and I, I think that's your question if this is one type or, or all the pits. So given what you test for and the allowable limits that are allowed to be in say, an open pit of some sort on a gas drilling site. Um, 
in terms, and, and you know more about kind of the use of this, but I'm just going to run down through these types of pits. So, for instance, a completion workover pit, uh, the way that's traditionally used by the industry, uh, from your understanding, would what you test for uh, allow for a traditional use of a completion workover pit? Yeah, any, any one As of these. used typically. It, it would, but any one of these pits, completion workover, uh, going through the list, I may be jumping ahead, but drilling fluid, freshwater makeup, mud circulation, reserve pit, saltwater disposal pit, washout pit, water condensate pit. Each one of those is defined, and our ordinance, by definition, allows those pits. So I guess would a uh, completion or workover pit be on the site? Uh, yes, because they're used for storage, disposal, spent completion fluids. But going further than, than just the yes, I think what you're asking, though, is if that's used, what are we looking for? And that's where the standards will be addressed. The concentration of TPH, for example, 15 milligrams per liter, uh, BTEX, 500 micrograms per liter, benzene and chloride, chloride content uh, being one of the specific items that are maybe easier to test, uh, 3,000 parts per million is, is what we're looking for. So in any of these pits, you'd still have to meet that standard. And I guess that, that I guess that's my question. Um, and <laughs> take for instance, I'll, we'll use one type of pit, um, salt water disposal pit. With the way that pit is typically used by the industry, the contents that you understand would be used in a salt water disposal pit. Would that be able to pass the standards that we have that you're looking for? It would have to pass those standards. I know it would have to, but in the way the industry typically uses a saltwater disposal pit, as you understand it, if you were to go and test a typical saltwater disposal pit at any given gas well site, would that, from your understanding, exceed the levels of what you're testing for? If, if it did, we have uh, different measures because that would be considered a violation of the ordinance. So if somebody uses that type of pit, it would have to meet those standards. If it didn't, we'd go through the penalty enforcement process just like any other violation. The use of that isn't regulated to say no. We're looking at what's in the pit. So you could use a saltwater disposal pit. This definition comes from the, the Railroad Commission's use of different pits. And again, it, it mimics that language. But what we're looking at is what's in that pit. And it would have to meet the same standards as, as every other uh, pit that is used. So a saltwater disposal pit has to meet that chloride content level. And I, and I understand that by definition of our ordinance as, as that. I guess <laughs> maybe you're intentionally not wanting to. Uh, your understanding of what generally goes into a pit like that, because I think that's the question, is what we're, we seemingly are allowing all these pits and there's concerns about what's the content of this pits and what's spilling over in a rainstorm or all these other sorts of things. Would a typical saltwater disposal pit, as we understand how it's typically used by the industry with the typical types of products that they use, in your professional opinion, would that generally be outside the range of what's allowable according to our ordinance in terms of what you're testing for? And, and that's the difficulty. I mean, it, it, it is answered with, with the basis of the ordinance in mind. If that pit were used, it has to meet that. The salt content to be considered salt water isn't close to 3,000 ppm. So it would be salt water, but not at that concentration. However, that salt water disposal pit, the concentrations in there would still have to meet this requirement. Yeah, I think there's a more encouraging answer so somewhere along the lines. I'll, let me re rethink how to uh, uh, address some of those questions, and I'll, I'll come back to you. I think Council Member Roden's question was, as typically used by industry, are they prevented from doing that uh, with, with the way that are ordinance, the way they typically use it? Understanding that they'll have to abide by the ordinance or they can't, uh, they get shut down. But as they typically do it, would this, would this prevent their typical use? Well, I think it would definitely not allow all of the produced water uh, because there, there may be salts contents mm -hmm. much higher than that. That isn't designed to prohibit the use of them. I think there would have to be either some dilution of the water 
or maybe at a different phase, the water that initially comes back at flow back, as an example, isn't as saline, so the salt's content won't be as high. So it, it could be used, but maybe not for the entire duration, because at some point the produced water would be too saline mm -hmm. to meet our ordinance. So it would be out there maybe on a limited basis, not for the entire duration, as typically used in, say, West Texas, a salt water disposal pit may be out there to allow the water to evaporate, and all you're left with is the salt. We probably won't get to that point because it wouldn't meet our, our requirements. Okay. Council Member Gregory. Thanks. Uh, one of the first comments you made is you were explaining some of the modifications to the fifth draft. Uh, you were talking about the compression <coughs> stations. Um, and the compression stations now being included in some of the definitions. Um, in, in pretty plain terms, what is the impact of that? What, what, how, how does that in any way benefit the citizens? Well, what it does is specifically define what a compressor station is. I think there may have been some ambiguity as to who was using the term compressor stations. There are compressors typically on a drill site, that, a lift compressor, for example. Those are on the site. They're used to help stimulate the, the well production once the pressures drop off. Uh, those are already in our definition of a drilling and production site. Right. So this definition of compressor stations is more for an off-site uh, transmission system. <laughs> the compressor stations are considered to be part of the pipeline. So anything that has a connection to a transmission pipeline now there's a definition for those. That definition, in addition to laying out a, a definition, uh, is going to have to meet the uh, separation standards and noise requirements. So the, the benefit of having a separation standard from a, a regular drill site, the same benefits would be achieved by adding this definition. Same thing with the noise impact. Compressors, they run 24-7, they, they generate noise. We're including by adding that definition, we're including them under our noise management standards as well. So those two would both be a benefit to that. So up until now, we had nothing. We didn't really address compressor stations at all. We didn't even have a definition. And in this ordinance, that. what we're doing is saying that a compressor station that may be associated with a high pressure pipeline, we now have setback requirements that we didn't have before, and we now have uh, uh, noise limitations that we did not have before. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. But there's been a, quite a bit of, of concern among our citizens, uh, demands even, that we eliminate compression, compression stations altogether. Um, and I don't know who would like to address this, but, but I think that we, the, the rest of the citizens need to understand some of what council has been uh, uh, advised on regarding why we wouldn't just outright eliminate a compressor station that's on a uh, high-powered gas transmission line. And, and I think one of the difficult things with that is now you're getting into whether or not that system is, is operational. The compressor stations help move the gas. Without compression, the gas is, is no longer flowing. And that has impacts upstream as well as downstream from what the pipeline is considered the midstream component. So if that isn't pressurized, if the gas isn't flowing, uh, then it is disruptive to the, the sale of gas, the distribution of gas, the transport. So there's a lot of ramifications to say that you couldn't compress it. The system needs that compression in order to keep uh, moving. So I, I think that would be one of the difficult things with with a prohibition, at least from a hydraulic standpoint. And, and if the city attorney wants to um, add in, I think it would be helpful. Uh, Councilman, I'll be glad to uh, put my shoulder to the wall a little bit as well on this particular issue. Uh, <coughs> compressor stations are part of the equipment used by pipeline companies to move the gas into intrastate or interstate commerce. Pipeline companies are deemed to be public utilities under the Utilities Code in the state of Texas. As such, they operate with certain powers, including powers of eminent domain. 
And further, they have a certain powers in their own right. They act as sovereigns and, and, and to a certain extent in their own right. And so the issue then becomes the city's regulation of an entity uh, which itself has eminent domain authority. So what I think the council has directed is that we would use some of our zoning powers here, particularly our um, ability to require setbacks and our ability to impose these noise, noise ordinance provisions, which are particular um, to gas operations to the compressor stations as well. So that's the direction that we've gone in this ordinance and, and that's really why. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Camp. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. And Anita, thank you for that explanation. Uh, the only thing that I would ask with, with the explanation, because you, you do have direction from council, okay, and what we are authorized to do in the city. But this council is not authorized and doesn't have the authority to ban compressors, do we? Or the comp compressor station. Because it's part of the pipeline. I believe that the compressor stations are in fact part of the pipeline and the pipeline companies again being uh, public, public utilities, utility. I think that it would be an attempt to ban a public utility. So that, that would be the logical conclusion of where would you, you would be going. So applying your zoning power is probably the better approach to this. Okay, thank you. Council Member King. I have a similar question. Uh, I guess our council also we don't have the legal ability to ban gas wells, and we don't have the legal ability to ban fracking. I mean, we can change things, we can amend things, but it's at its base level, we just can't stop that. That question really goes to um, the interest of property owners, of which the mineral interests, um, they, they are. They, they own property as surely as service owners do and to simply disallow the taking of their own property through their oil and gas exploration, I think is, uh, is certainly problematic. Council Member Roden. I'm gonna beat the dead pit here a second. Um, closed loop system, which is a part of our ordinance. Uh, what sort of pits does that uh, do away with. So for instance, if, if we're looking at the definitions, in the definition of closed loop mud system, it says a system using a combination of solids control equipment incorporated in a series of steel takes that eliminates the use of a pit. Uh, what sort of pits in that list of pits that we have, again, under the definitions, uh, are eliminated uh, once a closed loop system is required? The reserve pit? By definition, uh, you, you won't see those, except maybe some of the sites that currently have them, but under the new ordinance, we won't see new uh, <coughs> reserve pits and mud circulation pit. The circulation of the mud would be part of that closed loop system. That's what the loop is. It keeps the, the mud from sitting in the pit. So those two would, would likely go away under a closed loop system for new sites. The way I understood it, that while we're not banning pits, the closed loop system certainly eliminates the need for those sorts. And then our testing, the way I understood it was that what we're testing for, while we're not eliminating pits and we're allowing them by law, kind of by definition, they're not able to use them in the way that they typically would use them. Is that an accurate uh, assessment of my understanding of how pits will be utilized, or in this case, not utilized as a result of the requirements in our ordinance when you combine closed loop system requirements with what you are testing for? I'm gonna throw another curveball because I, I, I'm not gonna be designing the, their, their system, the, sure. the engineer for that company will. With that caveat, I think they will have to come up with a new approach other than what we may see again out in West Texas where getting back to at least the, the one you talked about, saltwater disposal pits, if that were left as an evaporative pit, our concentrations may require them to do a different something else something else yeah. and come up with a new solution because the, the 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 standard one or the old one may not work and we've seen that as these closed loop systems come along that's that's kind of a, a newer 
kind of an urban push behind getting that technology out there. It's been used before, but I think with the heightened awareness in the last couple of years, it's become more commonplace. And even older sites in Denton are now going to a closed loop system without the requirement that you know this hasn't been adopted. But we're seeing that as, as technology has changed. To your question, especially saltwater as well as wells, I, I will feel comfortable that we will see something different. Yeah, that, that's good, and that's that's the comfort I was getting as I was exploring that issue. And that wasn't that much of a curveball. You, okay. you, you you threw it straight, and it, um, and I appreciate that. But and just for everyone else's comfort, an operator coming into the city um, upon their permitting process, they'll understand those sorts of requirements they have in terms of testing, and they'll know how to operate their facility accordingly. Uh, and uh, is that correct? Which will have an impact on what sort of pits they may or may not choose? Every application that we see goes through a series of permits. You may have to get a plat. That might be the only one. You may have to get a site plan. Anything where this would apply, you would go through a site plan process. You would get an individual permit for the specific well. During that process, the, the application is reviewed by city staff, and we sit down with the applicant through comment and feedback period and go over all the provisions of our ordinance to make sure exactly what you're saying that the applicant is aware of what requirements uh, we are going to impose on issuing that permit or, or approving their plan. Thanks, Darren. Thank you. Councilmember Watts. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> Darren, on the saltwater disposal pit, um, it, it's my understanding, and I may be incorrect, that that's part of the fracking process. Is that right, or is this water that's just coming out of the well while they're drilling? It. it it would be, again, the definition of salt water, whether or not it's usable. If the, if the water's coming back, it's not considered reusable from like a potable water standpoint. It could be recycled on the location, you could be used again, as we talked about uh, the ability to put it back into the well. Right. But what this does is, is typically put the water that is from the formation, and that's where the salt contents definitely increases. The formation water will be used and put in here. That's during the, the either the flow back or the production phase is when the water comes back. And, and I guess that's my question um, because on the, the very minor change in that 3322.5 PI, which is the flow back or the reinjection into the well or another well, uh, it states for the duration of the flow back, recovered liquids, which I'm assuming salt water would be defined as a recovered liquid shall be routed into one or more storage vessels. Now, it, it, is it my understanding that storage vessels, a pit, is could be considered a storage vessel? I guess I interpret that more along as either a tanker truck or something, but you're saying the, the pits are part of that, because if it's not, then it, that particular paragraph, unless the pit is a storage vessel, would not allow that flow back to go into a pit. It, we have a specific definition. One of the things you'd thrown out was tank. Uh -huh. We define what a tank is. So anything that would store the water would be considered that type so of that vessel. So that would be a storage vessel, so a pit, so a pit would be would considered be a storage vessel. Correct. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Thank you. Any other questions of staff before we go to the public hearing? Any other questions of staff? Thank you. Okay, at this time, I will open the public hearing on agenda item 6A relative to the uh, amendment, proposed amendment of the Denton Development Code relating to gas well drilling and production. And I have many cards uh, of folks wishing to speak. Uh, let me, since so many folks, I mean, there are, there are a number of folks here that have spoken before or have been to council meetings before and, and kind of know the ropes. A number of other folks are um, you know, new faces, and, and so I'll, I'll give a real general explanation of, of how things work. We would request that uh, you follow along the speakers that precede and try not to repeat the same thing. That makes it respectful for everyone's time uh, and bring forth whatever new information that you want to bring. Uh, be respectful of each other. Uh, uh, we don't allow demonstrations one way or the other. You can't hoot down people you don't particularly like what they're saying, and, and you can't cheer people that you particularly love what they're saying. Uh, that 
it cuts down on time when that happens, and uh, it tends to um, be disrespectful for some people or, or uh, disproportionate in its, in its effect. And so we try to be very respectful of everybody's opinion. That's what democracy is all about. And so we have our, our rules that try to allow that to, um, to take place in chambers. So please be respectful of each other. And, uh, and remember that we can't uh, interact with you as you speak. So don't, don't ask a question and expect an answer because that's not the kind of forum. This is your time to uh, make suggestions, to make observations, and uh, to, to talk to us, give us your, your uh, ideas. And um, you know, as you can see, we have plenty of time where we, we talk away. So, um, but this is your time, so, uh, so do follow it. What I'll do is I will announce a name, and then I'll announce who the next speaker will be so that next person can get ready, we can move down, we, we, we can have a pretty quick process. Uh, we have over um, 30 cards of folks wishing to speak. So that's a lot of folks, and that's a lot of time. Um, but if we, if we follow along and try not to repeat so much, uh, I think we'll, we'll be in, in a pretty good shape to get everyone in, in a decent time where everyone's paying attention to each other still. So uh, at this time, I do open the public hearing. And the first uh, speaker is Gilbert Mojica. And the next speaker to follow will be Benjamin Butler. Gilbert? And if you'll state your name and your address, then your time will start. My name is Gilbert Mojica. I live at 804 West Hickory Street. Um, I'm here just as a concerned citizen that wants to be able to bathe in my own water and drink my water from my sink. And as I've learned more about fracking, I found that to be probably impos an impossible task. Um, and I just look to you guys as leaders, as people that are in charge of this city, that are hopefully guiding us into a safe direction and one that is in the best interest of its citizens. Um, as set by the precedents of local of area towns such as Flower Mound um, and South Lake, I just hope that we can look to them as the example that they have set where they have banned compressor stations, where they have a higher level of air monitor monitoring and water mount monitoring. And I just hope that that Denton can follow their footsteps, that Denton can be a leader and make this, this town safer to live in. Thank you very much. Uh, then Benjamin Butler to be followed by Sharon Wilson. All right. Um, well, first and foremost, it's an honor to be here with everyone, and uh, I think we all have this sense that... If you could say your, your address also, I'm sorry. I oh, I'm on 804 Hickory Street. Cool. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, I think we can all sense that the, the ordinances aren't as strong as they could be, and I certainly would like to see um, as much of a ban of fracking as possible in this city. And I think that we all know that this is a beautiful city worth protecting. And as Ryan just mentioned, I, um, I feel uncomfortable drinking water sometimes when I know that there's a risk, that there's something in it that um, might harm me or my loved ones. So I encourage us all to stand together today and do what, um, do what feels right. Um, I know we're gonna hear a lot of wonderful voices tonight and um, one other personal thing, I'm actually, my hometown is South Lake, and to me, I sense this um, great sense of injustice when cities that um, are more affluent get better regulations in place. Um, I think we all sense the wrongness in that, and um, there's so much here in Denton that I feel like is worth protecting, and so many people love this city so much. So I encourage all of y'all to um, follow that sense of rightness and um, not vote these ordinances in. Thank you. Thank you. Then Sharon Wilson to be followed by Pauline Raffiston. I, 
have a video I need to show. You'll be able to see. No, I'm, I'm asking, would it be possible for those standing um, to, to be seated at least through um, the thing so that everyone behind you can see uh, what, what's being presented? Sharon Wilson, 1121 Belvedere, Allen, Texas. Um, I'm a former Denton resident. I've been working with this community for four years to try to get a better drilling ordinance. This is a, a video of a compressor station in Denton County, it's uh, Devon and Cross Tex Energy uh, Facility. The smoke and the white uh, vapors that you see are volatile organic compounds that are invisible to the naked eye. This is what you're thinking you might allow in the city and actually regulate. Um, I'm speaking today in solidarity with those citizens of Ditton who are opposed to this weak ordinance and who demand greater protections from a polluting industry. Um, I've been standing here before you for four years now, and I've decided what it comes down to is zip codes. If you're in the right zip code, you get a protective ordinance. If you're in the wrong zip code, you get an ordinance like the one that you have right now. Um, I can tell you that you are getting some disastrously bad information. Flares are not green completions. Um, if you write this down, Reuters article, fracking rules let drillers flare until 2015. When the EPA came out with their new rules, industry had such a fit and said they did not have enough equipment for green completions without doing flaring. So the EPA extended their time frame on this issue until 2015. Here's an excerpt from the article. Now drillers will have until 2015 to invest in equipment that capture the emissions, a process known as green completion. Until then, they can burn off or flare gas. I've sat here tonight and listened to the wrong information given to you repeatedly. And I mean, this is an ongoing occurrence from the task force when you allowed industry to come in here and be on the task force. And Ed Ireland, who is a, he is um, an industry trade organization that does nothing but promote the industry. So you have gotten a lot of bad information. Flowback cannot all be recycled because it doesn't all return to the surface. When they talk about recovered liquids, they are talking about flowback, recovered from the flowback, from the uh, fracking. Those liquids are routed into a tank. I think I've sent you videos about this. The flowback tanks have 18 by 18 vent holes in them. They are allowed to, to uh, to vent the flowback vapors out into the communities. We've had a lot of complaints over this. It's a step that the EPA admitted they missed in their rules. Okay, you'll have to. You know, your I have, I've been following your three minute rules now, your three minute talking rules, for four years now. So I think tonight you're going to have to have me escorted out. Uh, I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. I can't allow you to co to continue on that basis. Okay. Well, I'm it, I'm going to keep disrespectful reading. to the next speakers, and there are 30 people behind you to speak. Right. And and, and you're so, taking their time. So right. Please, so you may have to have me escorted conclude. out. Please conclude. I would I would ask for you to have me just escorted out because I'm not going to stop talking. You have gotten bad information. This this community is in jeopardy. There's no reason to allow pits. There's no reason to allow pits in at all. Other communities have banned the pits. I'm, they have I'm never been sorry, sued for the pits. I'm very sorry, but I have to cut pits. you off. And, and if it's your wish to be escorted out, then that's what will happen. And I'll have to request that.
the officer escort or escort you out to allow the other speakers to speak. Okay. I, was I, I tried. It's not stopping. <laughs> I have a cutoff button, but it doesn't work. <laughs> so, uh, Pauline Raveston. And To be, to be followed by Bruce Walker. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, I'm sorry, Pauline Raffiston, to be followed by Bruce Walker. Okay. Good evening, my name is Pauline Raffiston. I live at 2015 Bowling Green Street. I am speaking tonight in solidarity with those citizens of Denton who are opposed to this weak ordinance and who demand greater protection from a polluting industry. Tonight, I'd like to give you a short history of my experience with the ordinance rewriting process. Almost two years ago, I heard that Denton was going to revise its drilling ordinance. I had recently become aware of the fact that Denton sat on the Barnet Shale, that our city was full of wells, and that fracking was a legally and technically complex practice with potentially harmful effects on our environment, safety, and health. Wow, that was a lot to take in for the health-conscious mother of a then three-year-old. So I was excited to hear that Denton was on top of things and that work, uh, what Denton was working toward a stronger ordinance. In the PowerPoint presentation at the August 25th, 2011 meeting about phase two of the ordinance rewriting, the number one reason for having an ordinance was, I quote, to protect the health, safety, and general welfare of the public and the quality of the environment. That was encouraging. The presentation went on to list topics of discussion of what could be envisaged in phase two. These suggestions included vapor recovery, air quality monitoring, water quality monitoring, prohibition of flaring, chemical free fracking, ha, prohibition of compressor stations, collection stations, tank farms, and land farms within the corporate city limits. Those were some of the improvements that the city considered making back in 2011. How many of these have, are included in the version of the ordinance we are looking at tonight? None. Why? because it seems that the city is afraid to impose stronger regulations on the industry. Would this have anything to do with the fact that city council seems to have received most of its information from industry representatives and lawyers? Would this have anything to do with the fact that the drilling task force was dominated by industry-friendly members? Would this have anything to do with the fact that, with the exception of Councilman Roden and Councilman Engelbrecht, I have never seen any of you at the DAG information meetings, which included presentations by scientists, attorneys, economists, environmentalists, and even the mayor of a municipality that had encountered major issues with fracking. Of course, it had everything to do with it. Why else would other, th would other cities in the Barnet Shell be able to impose much tougher regulations on the gas industry? Their jurisdiction is just as limited as yours, yet they have listened to their citizens and they have crafted good, strong ordinances. South Lake has done it, Flowerman has done it, and Corinth has done it. And they have done so while staying within the limits of what a city can legally do. Why can't Denton do it? When I see the version of the ordinance we're considering tonight, I cannot help but think that the last two years of meetings and public hearings have been nothing but a travesty. The citizens of Denton have done a lot of homework on this topic. They have spent many an evening away from their family to figure out what to put in the new ordinance. What we asked for is not in the document we're looking at tonight. I urge you to please go back to the drawing board and draft a proper ordinance. If you want to know what that looks like, we can help you. Thank you. The next speaker is Bruce Walker, to be followed by Mark McCorb. Uh, Bruce Walker, 9805 Grandview, Denton, Texas. I appreciate that the City Council has addressed a lot of my clean air and clean water concerns today in the ordinance. Therefore, if what I addressed tonight has been covered great, if it, if it reinforces what is now addressed in the ordinance, then I apologize for the redundancy. Regardless, I thank you for addressing these very serious concerns. I believe if done right and frequent enough will go a long way to help keep our citizens safer. Let me reinforce the need as I see it. As we all know, excessive exposures to gas well air releases and fracking will cause cancer. I grew up having heard about the Love Canal in Northeast and the water pollution exposed by Erwin Brockovich. There were many cancer deaths of adults and children. That thing kind of sticks in your mind. 
We do not need to start down that path here in Denton with the many safety unknowns of the fracking process. Here's what I heard the drillers say about their process. The process is safe and designed to keep gas separate. We embrace the new technologies as they evolve. The TCEQ and the TRRC test and inspects for compliance. Not all drillers are the same. They, all concerned about, they are all concerned about clean air and clean water just like us. Here is what the reality of the situation. The process uses a lot of water and it's forever contaminated. The process is not simple and must be done right. Many problems occur during the drilling process and most problems are pollution. The critical cementing process must be done right. Long-term effect of the integrity of the steel casing and cement sealing is not known. Texas has active moving soil. There are numerous vapor releases during drilling and mechanical equipment piping and valving does fail over time. Not all the drillers have the same financial backing and do not always embrace the expensive, quote, correct way to extract natural gas. There are many known cancer-causing chemicals in the fracking water. There are many known cancer-causing chemicals in air releases. Natural gas is a dangerous high explosive as we saw in Louisville. The TCEQ air monitoring is infrequent and not effective. The Texas Railroad Commission inspection process is less than 1% and a lot of those inspections are office paper inspections. I congratulate the city of Denton for taking the preventive approach to protecting the citizens' health by inspecting what you expect from the gas drillers on water wells, pre-testing and after-testing and monitoring to hold accountable. On air quality, you must have continuous monitoring, especially at air compressor stations. Adequate and frequent monitoring or testing will prevent the problem. Thank you for taking the cautious approach for citizens' health and safety. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Mark McCord to be followed by Lee Stone. Mark McCord, 16, 616 Colorado Street in Salina. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you tonight. And um, Councilman Roden, in comment uh, to your questions regarding a, a pit, I just want to point out that under the BLM's Texas Resources Management Plan and under U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it is a violation of federal law to allow any open pit that holds anything other than fresh water for protection against um, harm coming to wildlife and migratory birds. So the law is that you have to have a covering of some kind of screen or something over any open pit if you're going to be in compliance with federal law on an open pit. Now, I appreciate the fact that you're talking about water. I hope you understand that it's the single most important thing you're going to consider in this whole process. According to the World Health Organization, less than one quarter of 1% of all the water on earth is fresh water available for us to drink, use for hygiene, grow and prepare our food, water our plants, water our animals, our livestock and our pets, and any other use that we have for fresh water. And the water used in fracking is fresh water. They cannot use the other water because it's contaminating and damaging to their pipes, their pumps, and other infrastructure. And anybody that tells you they can recycle water is lying through their teeth. If you want to know the truth, go to Devon Energy's website. They were the leading company trying to recycle water. And what they found was that they could clean about 7 out of every 1,000 gallons, but they also state that if they used recycled water, it raises their production costs by 70%. And currently, gas sells for about 30% of the break-even cost of production. Nobody's making any money today, and they're sure not going to make any money if they have to increase their production costs by 70%. Industry will tell you all kind of fairy tales. They know you don't know anything about this stuff. They know the people in other city councils, other places don't either. And they know that most of you will never make an effort to find out what the facts are. You'll accept what they tell you, you'll believe it, and then you'll find out when it's too late, like the people did up in uh, Demick, Pennsylvania, when their water supply was tainted. So I would encourage you to think very carefully and put restrictive covenants in your ordinance that protects your water because it's your legacy. 
Ultimately, if you run out of water because you allowed people to frack, what are you going to tell your constituents? What are you going to tell your families when they don't have water to drink or they don't have water to, for hygiene? I'd like you to understand that water is a super critical issue, probably the single most important issue you will face and you will consider. So when you think about drilling, think about the water they use. Now, in places I've been, they like to claim we only use 1% of the city's annual water use, but the other 99% goes back into the water treatment system, gets recycled, and is used again. The water used in fracking is forever and permanently disposed of by injecting 15 to 18,000 feet down into the Ellenberger Formation, where theoretically it can't come back up. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Lee Stones, followed by Rhonda Love. Well, 35 years of my life has been spent in the all business. And gay. Oh, I'm sorry. Name and address. And oh, you might Lee pull, Stone. You might pull the speaker down. <laughs> I can't get taller. <laughs> Lee Stone, 2027 Fordham Lane. I've spent 35 years of my life in the oil business and gas. When a guy from one of the majors used to offer to buy my lunch, I'd say, you buy all my lunches. So, I'm speaking as an equal opportunity offender. I'm not going to argue against fracking or I do understand mineral rights. I'm not going to argue against compression stations, although I do think where they go can be uh, influenced by city. I do know a lot about the industry. It's a tough business with tough people. And they are not going to spend a dime out of their profit margins that they don't absolutely have to. I have seen all kinds of corners cut, and I have seen regulations ignored, and in response, I can speak of not the recent past, but everything goes in a saltwater pit to include the occasional cow and drunk roughneck. So, my last job was in the Barnett Shale. Temporary buildings, we had three wells drilled and working, and we had mandatory back-end parking. Think about it. And I, I understand there are five wells, wells at Geyer. So at least get the kids to back in, right? Strategy 101 for every beginning teacher is to get a hold of your class on the first day. It doesn't get easier after that. A wise council member will screw his or her courage to the sticky place and go watch Lincoln again and write the toughest ordinance you can, you can write. I didn't want this fight. I did my fights in the 60s and 70s. And I was good at it. But I thought, you know, I can leave this fight to others. And they have stood up to the plate. Come on, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Rhonda Love, followed by Raul Rodriguez. My name is Rhonda Love. I live at 1921 Holly Hill Lane in Denton, Texas. I've lived here for three years. Both of my grandfathers were in the oil business in Texas and in Oklahoma. So I appreciate that the oil and gas industry has brought many good things to many people and it will continue to do so. I'm sure I personally profited by those men in my family leaving farming and going into other kinds of business. I also appreciate your work, the work of the staff, and the work of the task force. 
I've been to numerous city council meetings. I've spoken to you. I have been to task force meetings. I missed only one, I believe. I've been to every public meeting I could get to. And I went to the debates in the city election and I heard what some of you said. Tonight, I'm speaking in solidarity with the citizens of Denton who are opposed to this weak ordinance and who demand greater protections from the polluting industry. You need to send this draft back to the staff with instructions to write an ordinance that uses all the powers we have as a home rule city. One of your major concerns should be the health of Denton's children and people whose health is already compromised by disease and poor living conditions that make them more vulnerable to pollutants and irritants. Denton has one of the highest rates of childhood asthma in North America. We also have very high rates of cardiovascular disease and related problems in our vulnerable populations. All of these health conditions can be caused by pollution and they're certainly exacerbated by it. You know this because I've already told you and I wrote you with two other people a very thorough paper about it, full of references that are still relevant. These other municipalities, Flower Mound and South Lake, have stronger ordinances as we do as I understand the situation. But these citizens don't have the same kinds of health vulnerabilities and resource vulnerabilities that the citizens of Denton do. It appears as though the city councils in Flower Mound and South Lake care more about their citizens than you do as reflected in the fifth draft. I don't actually believe that. I think all of you really care. But something is amiss and out of place. These drafts are not strong enough. They're not the strongest ones you can write. Say ditto to everything that everybody in front of me said. Is it true that citizens with more resources are more likely to get more protections? That's the way it feels right now. Your responsibilities are great and heavy, but you need to protect your citizens in every possible way. Between now and the end of the moratorium, you have plenty of time to have more public input, more meetings like this. Let the public talk to the staff and the lawyer. I hope that after this meeting, you will instruct the staff to write a stronger ordinance and one with the protections that are requested by DAG. Thank you very much. Thank you. Raul, Raul Rodriguez, followed by Crystal Wayne. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a council member, Roden has a question. Um, yeah, Ms. Love, no, Dr. Love. Just a moment, I'm sorry. There's a question council member Roden has. Of okay, that's all right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks, Rhonda. Since you have been in involved in various stages of the process, could you be specific as to, you mentioned weak ordinance, strong ordinance. Is there specific things after hearing what we talked about already today uh, that are still left out from your opinion uh, that you think we need to add to strengthen our, organist, uh, our ordinance as it is? Um, I wrote this and thought about this after the fifth draft and after uh, people from DAG considered uh, the staff's responses to our questions. So I haven't had the time to really consider what you have talked about tonight and I wasn't at your earlier meeting. Obviously, it's air and water pollution, anything you can do to control that. I must say, I laughed. I know you didn't mean to be funny, Ms. Burgess, but when you said it was problematic to ban fracking, it's all problematic, isn't it? <laughs> Every single thing you're talking about is problematic, but not impossible, not impossible. So I'm going to defer to some of the other speakers uh, to, uh, I think Sharon Wilson is a source of expertise, Ms. Uh, Dr. Briggle also about what the specifics are that we need to make it stronger, but all of this talk, why do we need pits? Really, uh, I, I heard you, but I will defer to others who know more about the technicalities. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, okay. Mr. Rodriguez and then uh, Crystal Wayne. Good evening. My name is Raul Rodriguez. I'm a combat Vietnam veteran, 68 to 69. In Could you say your address also, please? I'm sorry? Your address? My address is 804 Campbell Lane. The reason that I am here today is to let you know that I oppose any well digging anywhere in the city or around the city. Now, I don't know how it happened, but I was going through some news and I decided to read all of you's background 
and I was impressed. I still am. And some of you have decided to remain here in Denton since you were raised here in Denton. Uh, that, in effect, tells me that you would like to have families here like everybody else. Now, the reason that I came here is because while I was reading the effects of the gas drilling, it reminded me that I had a problem too. I have Agent Orange poisoning. My heart is diseased. I have other organs also, but just recently I had an evaluation or re-evaluation and of course the VA finally found it in their heart to give me a percentage increase which was bringing me up from 50 to 70 percent disability. Even though I could stand up here, you see me holding on to something. At home, I hold on to the lawnmower. Why? Because I have to cut my grass in sections. I cannot do it like I used to. Not anymore. I also get sometimes the same symptoms I had before I went into and had a triple bypass. Now, since then, I had uh, acquired a family, which, of course, gave me two great-grandchildren. And I'll tell you, I don't think that I would want them around the gas well. One is three, one is five. But, as I said, that uh, whatever I get from the VA does nothing for me. What is there? A do uh, uh, doctor told me when I asked him, how uh, long do you think that I may have yet? He smiled at me. <laughs> well, those things are kind of hard to say. Yes, they are. But I could have had probably a few more years. But, like I said, I do not agree with uh, the industry coming in and polluting water, air for our children. This is a, a great city, great people in it. Incidentally, I came here from Belton, Central Texas, to get educated. I was not able to finish. I had one year left, my student teaching, so I had to go. Now I can't. I can't go like I wanted to, but I live with that. I did my duty for my country, and I'll pass it on to other young ones. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Crystal Wayne, followed by Michael Wyatt. My name is Crystal Wayne. I live at 1308 Broadway Street. Like the speaker before me, I am also a combat veteran. I made my home in Denton in 1996. In I joined after I graduated from UNT. My last tour I spent in Iraq. I spent most of my time outside the wire. Yes, as a female, I was outside the wire. It was very stressful, but obviously you have to find some way to cope. So at night when I couldn't sleep, I'd go out and climb up on my 11-foot uh, Sorry, my Humvee, my apartment Humvee. I'd close my eyes, and I'd be like, and I'd just pretend. I'm back at the courthouse square. I'm on the lawn. I'm eating Old South fudge ice cream from Beth Marie's. <laughs> so when you ask me what I was fighting for when I was overseas, that is it. And here again, I find out, wait a minute. I'm having to fight again, but I'm on my own soil here. Please, please, make these ordinance stronger or just go ahead and stop them. Currently, I'm working at a equine therapeutic riding center outside the city limits. I just started a veterans program there this fall to help veterans like myself with their transition back from service <coughs> into civilian life, because trust me, it's not easy. I'm wanting to build a, my own ranch here in the city limits because resources for the city of veterans, for the city of Denton veterans is rather limited. 
and I would really love to do this out on Country Club Road, somewhere out there, but I can't do that with sick or dead horses. I can't do that with veterans that when we were overseas, yeah, we were already subjected to chemicals. I didn't expect to come home and be subjected to chemicals from my own faucet, from my own air. Please, please, do more research. Listen to more people, not just the industry. Please listen to the citizens. Please, please, do research on your own. We elected you to do this for us. I understand we only have three, sec three minutes, but you guys have all the time in the world. Please use your time wisely, and please stop this or put more higher strictures on it. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Wiley, followed by Rebecca Hinojosa. I'm sorry, Mike, Michael Wiley? Oh, okay. My name is Michael Wiley. I have my, I'm saying on my phone, give me a second. Um, I live at 910 Avenue A. Okay. Um, I moved here to Denton about three years ago whenever I uh, transferred back to the University of North Texas. Um, I, I'd gone to Texas Tech in Lubbock and I had really kind of missed the campus here, just kind of missed the feel of Denton. Um, There's just this, like, I don't know, when I first came here, I kind of fell in love with the town. There's just unique beauty to the city. Um, it's not like a normal suburb like I grew up. It's just kind of like the normal run, drain, and everything. Um, just in this little town, there's like a bunch, there's a lot of culture and a lot of really awesome people that just, I don't know, I don't know how you can't not just love this little town. Um, so when I read this ordinance, I'm kind of, it fills me with anger. I don't understand how, I don't know. I see these neighboring cities that pride themselves on being beautiful cities. Um, South Lake, Flower Mound come to mind. And they do. They have very strong ordinances that really, truly protect their towns. Um, they, they have wealth in other areas. They made us have money, but I feel like we have so much other wealth in just our people and just how our town is. People from, I've met people from other cities, other states that come here, and they remember coming to Denton, Texas. Um, people may not know about Denton if they've never been, but when they've been here, they a little bit of them stays here. This is just a place you really remember, um, which is why it, it baffles me whenever uh, we speak about this ordinance being for our best intention, uh, having our safety at heart. Um, I don't see how that can be so with there are so many issues that were brought up, especially from from DAG, for instance. And I read the reasons as to why a lot of those were introduced. And no, I wasn't in here in the beginning presentation, so a few of those may have been already addressed. But I know quite a few of them are still open, um, still have not been not been implemented in the ordinance. And so I just I just don't see how that can still be for here. I just I'm afraid this ordinance is going to ruin what makes Denton so beautiful. Um, no one wants to come into a town filled with fracking. We've, I've been up here before and I've spoke about Dish, Texas. Uh, the mayor, the former mayor himself moved away because of the fracking issue. I feel like that's a standpoint alone because they had a very weak ordinance. Um, I just, I hear stories of people in the crowd about being scared for their children to go up, grow up here, um, being scared to drink the water. Um, and that scares me as a future place to live. Um, and I'm going to apologize to the rest of the crowd. Um, I don't think y'all listen to the city enough, so I'm air going your three minute rule um, to try to like get my message across. Take those suggestions seriously. The DAG suggestions; those are those are for the intention of the community because DAG is the community. They have no ulterior motive besides 
looking out for their family, everyone else's families, their friends, and the future residents of Denton. Um, and if you don't mind to conclude, I recognize what you said, but if you don't mind to conclude. Um, yeah, I just have a few more talking points. Um, a few of my reasons for being so against it. Um, that doesn't sound like a conclusion. <laughs> no, it's not really a conclusion. I understand. Um, I'll make one more request for you to conclude. I appreciate your request, but I'm going to have to respectfully decline. Okay. Um, then I, I will have to respectfully request that uh, you be escorted out and so that the next speakers can speak. We have a lot of folks to follow you. <laughs> Rebecca Hinojosa, followed by Tom LaPointe. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rebecca Hinojosa. I live at 621 Schmitz Avenue, Denton, Texas, 76209 area code. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you look back in the audience, you can see these beautiful shades of green and these wonderful stickers that say, Don't Frack with Denton, which clearly gets our, uh, our message across about, you know, how we feel um, these ordinances are, are going along. Don't frack with Denton. This is what you all are doing. There are a lot of things that have been happening in this process of developing these ordinances that have been insulting. Uh, the presence of industry gentlemen um, in, the, in the city, um, the lawyers who um, have been uh, basically t scaring you all with the lawsuit so you all roll over in those closed meetings that we're not allowed in, that's, that's really insulting. Um, also, I remember back in the summer when Denton Beyond Coal had a little forum and Mayor Mark Burroughs came and spoke to us, which was really great. And I remember you telling some of us that you would agree to a fit $25 million insurance policy if you felt that the city really wanted it. And I would say if you look in the crowd that we really want a, a ban on fracking. We want strict ordinances. We want a strict insurance policy. So I want you to back what you said back in early summer and I want you to stand with the citizens of Denton. I want you to support clean land, air, and water. Um, yeah, I just, I foresee Denton becoming even more so polluted than it already is uh, with these weak ordinances. Um, I don't know if y'all are aware of what a super fun site is. Super fund, not super fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's what happens when uh, a industry comes in and dumps all these chemicals and they're allowed to do this because of a lack of regulations. And uh, clearly the gas well ordinances that have been constructed um, are weak ordinances, are, are, they're weak regulations. So I foresee a super fun site happening. And I actually grew up near a super fun site about 10 miles away from a super fun site uh, my entire life. And it's not fun to see friends of your family uh, ingest poisonous water and get toxic, um, toxic chemicals in their body that causes cancer, uh, illnesses where their skin falls off their bodies. Um, I just want you to stand with the citizens of Denton and I want you to make sure that our home doesn't turn into a super fun site. And I will also be um, not sticking with the three minute rule. So I just want everyone to join me in a little chant. Clean air, uh, clean I'm water, sorry, sorry. clean That's land a for us all. Clean um, air, Rebecca, water. Rebecca, I'm really sorry. That's a demonstration and that's not permitted. So if you'll please respect our institution and the ability for people to be heard. Would you, would you mind? And and understanding, understanding that you're not wanting to conclude, I'll have to ask for you to be escorted out. Would you escort her out, officer? Thank you. Tom LaPointe, followed by Vicki Oppenheim. Uh, good evening. My name is Tom LaPointe. I live at 1900 Highland Park Circle here in Denton, Texas. I'm Vicki Oppenheim, 600 Winfield Street here in Denton. And uh, 
we had, uh, as members of the former task force, we feel it was appropriate to talk, and if we may, this is a little bit of a tag team, and I'd like to let Vicki go first, if that's all right. Uh, it'll be a, we'll finish within six minutes. And if you'll state your name and start the time over again, if you don't mind, go ahead and state your name. Okay, Vicki Oppenheim, 600 Winfield Street here in Denton. Thank you very much for this opportunity. As you know, we were members of the Gaswell Task Force. We attended numerous meetings. We put a lot of work into this. And as you've heard tonight, the citizens of Denton really want a strong ordinance. We reviewed the minority report that we had submitted to you, and we felt it was really important that we look at that report in light of the draft five ordinance. Um, I'm not going to put the report card up there because I know some of the issues that we had pointed out had been addressed in your work session earlier today, and we do appreciate that. We would have give, com given compressor stations an F um, in terms of a grade, and I still have great concerns about compressor stations. I feel anything you can do within this jurisdiction of the city that's legal, we, we would hope that you would go as far as you can. If zoning restrictions can apply to these compressor stations, is it possible to have an SUP process? Is it possible to look at aesthetics, compatibility, screening, uh, in addition to the noise you've already mentioned, separation or distances from protected uses? All these things that I think there is legal precedent for in recent cases on the topic, and we just really want the city to go as far as you can go on this issue. We feel it's really important for the quality of life. Remember, you're setting a precedent, vested rights. If somebody, <laughs> if a, a company comes in and they put in an application, it is whatever the ordinance is at that time. So it's really important that you get it right at this point, and that's what we're asking for. Um, another thing was air quality. As you know, at that time we gave it a C. There's been some issues addressed. Green completions as defined in the ordinance is addressed. It is in there. Flaring. Well, it's iffy. It's residential districts only that you address. What about the entire city? I don't know, you know what you've thought about that, but right now, I mean, that's better than nothing, but it's not really going all the way and banning flaring in the city. Um, and, and some of the other elements that we, we looked at, storage tanks, um, and, you know, were there really specific items on that? I don't know. The VPUs are included, so we're very pleased with that. So we give it a mixed a mixed uh, review. Certainly the air monitoring is very important, and we're, we're glad to hear the city will be implementing an air monitoring program. We want things to be caught as they're happening and not for it to go on for years and, and um, public health issues to, to start arise. So on that, we're pleased. Um, I don't know what my time is. Okay. And also on water, we are pleased that you included the water monitoring. Tom's going to talk more about that. As already mentioned by many people in this room, we are concerned about water quality. We want the best possible monitoring that can be done for surface and groundwater. And, and Council Tom Member Gregory has a question for you. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for acknowledging that we're trying to address as many of the concerns as possible. I appreciate that. I'm trying to make a list of what I've heard. The general comments of make the ordinance stronger are not as helpful as some of the things that you've said because they're very specific. So my question is, do I have your list correct? Um, possibly looking at more zoning requirements for compression stations, including screening, the possible use of the SUP process. Yes. And um, look at a ban on all flaring in the city. Yes. Okay. And then maybe a after all of the comments are over, I, I would like for um, the staff to respond back and give us a little bit more specifics on, on <coughs> the details of what our ordinance says about flaring. But thank you, Vicki. I appreciate it. I just want to say, I mean, as I read it, it said residential, but yes, if the staff can clarify that, I, you know, if there's something I've misread, certainly. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, once again, I'm Tom LaPointe, 1900 Highland Park Circle here in Denton, and I'm very happy to be living here. As a matter of fact, it's a great area. Um, I want to talk to two things. One about water, groundwater is absolutely critical. And so the uh, green completions, it was good to hear about that in terms of 
uh, minimizing the overall use of water and the recycling issue still needs to be faced because I'm not quite as sure it's as expensive as it's been shown to be and so a complete circuit using that water over again to minimize the use of water always seems something good to look into in my, my opinion. Um, but I need to address, I think that with, with Dr. Banks' monitoring program, and we've worked at UNT uh, with Dr. Banks quite a bit on that, and I feel very strongly that if something were to show up, he would be able to catch it. It's an excellent, very few cities that I know about at all, let alone here in Texas, have such an, uh, an abundance of samples that are taken on a monthly basis. So something, if it goes awry, it's going to be catched, caught, excuse me, not catch, caught soon. Um, so I put a lot of faith in data and in monitoring. And that goes with the air, and I, I support what Vicki said 100%, that I think that's absolutely wonderful that that's being included in the new uh, draft that we hadn't seen before. And finally, with the, the time I have left, I want to speak not only to you but to everyone um, in that carbon footprint is very important, and it's been more and more in the news these days. And one of the reasons that natural gas has been so successful is it's actually allowed us uh, as the U.S., even though it didn't sign the Kyoto Protocol, to reach more closely the limits that are allowed for CO2 emissions because natural gas relative to coal is much cleaner burning, and that is something to be considered. Uh, if we don't have natural gas, we'll go to coal, and the other thing that people must consider in this region is that our air is bad because of the coal that's burned near Watsahatchee. Um, that comes up with the south winds, and you have to go outside in a nice cold breeze coming down from Wyoming uh, to get some clean air in here. And that's sad, but that doesn't have as much to do as the report from Flower Mound has just shown, as does some other aspects, vehicular and set point coal burning. So natural gas, in my opinion, needs to be viewed in the context of these other carbon, produ carbon dioxide producing uh, and sulfur producing, pollutant producing uh, activities. So the, what I've seen now of the ordinance and the revisions that's been discussed here in the meeting before uh, public comments, I think actually I'm encouraged. Um, mostly I'm encouraged by increased monitoring because as a scientist I like data and uh, the analyses of such data to produce results I think are absolutely critical. Then it depends on what's done with that. So we always move to do better and more efficient use of a resource. Thanks. Uh, you have a couple of questions. Councilmember Gregory. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor. Dr. LaPointe, uh, explain to me in a little more detail, if you can, what you mean about how we might need to address the recycling issue, recycling of water? Yeah, that's can, what I'm talking about. Can you closed talk loops, about? Closed loop. I mean, it seems to me that even with the higher expenses in closed loop, that's something that should be examined more because uh, one of the aspects, if, if we're trying to minimize overall water use and if we're trying to lessen the amount of water that ultimately uh, becomes unusable because of the uh, contaminants, because of the chemicals associated with gas well production, the less of that water we use, the better it is. And closed loop cycles will do that. Now, there are higher costs, but in my opinion, in urbanizing areas, um, uh, gas well, gas, natural gas production is going to have to be associated with some higher costs. Um, I thought we we were requiring a closed loop system. Is are you talking about a different kind of system? No, it is. I mean, I'm just saying that I think even though it's a closed, it needs to be a closed loop to lessen the amount of water using. Yeah. So I I agree with that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. And yeah. Councilmember Roden. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you both. I think you guys have been instrumental parts of this process. Spent many many hours in various capacities. So I appreciate. Everyone, there's a lot of people, but you guys are up here, so I wanted to thank you for that. Um, I've always been kind of a C student, so uh, my parents have made me concerned about grades. So I'm curious if you're willing to modify some of the grades <laughs> or if you'd have to go back and, uh, and look at that in light of some of the new revisions. Yes, I would modify some of the grades, like, for instance, compressor station from F to something. Okay. But it really depends on what the revision is. And as I said, we want as strong as possible. Okay. And, and ideally, honestly, it would be not even in industrial, I mean, residential areas at all. And we had originally requested 
uh, only in industrial areas. It's an industrial facility, you know, 2,000 feet from protected uses and a minimum. That's what we originally requested in our minority report. Whether that can happen, I don't know, but we really want you to go as far as possible. So I, we will revise it accordingly above the F, but we'll have to see what we see. Yeah, and, and Mr. Rode, I was uh, uh, willing to provide a few more incompletes than a grade, so we, we had our own. <laughs> I have a chance. Uh, and it, just to clarify a few things, <coughs> pardon me, air quality. Uh, you, you heard me, uh, or you heard us discuss very briefly, and it hasn't been fleshed out, but on the basis of where you hear our approach towards air monitoring and water monitoring, specifically with well monitoring, and you heard our surface monitoring efforts that are already in place, uh, is that satisfying to you in terms of what you have recommended or you guys have conceived or studied or seen other places? Well, I mean, generally you're saying there's going to be a air monitoring program I mean, obviously it has to be done correctly. Air monitoring is not easy. Um, and, you know, how that's done, who you hire, where the monitors are, the, all these things will affect the right. results. So that's all I can say. I, I hope that the best possible practices are utilized in whatever uh, program you implement. Can I amend Please. or add to that? Um, I agree with what Vicki said. It's important. The quality control on it is absolutely important, getting good firms to do it. But one of the things I was impressed with with the most recent study was the fact of use of windrows because that gives you a probabilistic look at where most of the wind goes and that gives you an opportunity then to sample where you can expect to see the higher concentrations at the appropriate time of day or season. That kind of, of view of these or these set points is absolutely critical. And, and in that sense, I was very impressed with this report. So. That kind of uh, good background, you know, you need the appropriate company to do it. I have no clue about costs or anything like that. I, that's not my purview. But uh, that kind of intelligent study was very well done. And you're referring to the Flower Mountain study? Yeah, that you exactly. Reviewed for us, right, which it just I came out. My final question, and this is for you, mostly as a professor, you mentioned you love data. And as I'm thinking about data from air and water uh, monitoring, uh, apart from the obvious implication of we're trying to kind of see the effects uh, from this particular industrial use, is there anything else that once we have this data that the scientific community, the local scientific community, what else could you make use of that sort of data uh, for? A lot. <laughs> but one of the key things is that, you know, my background in risk assessment, you, you can put things in relative risk and we can then begin to identify where some of the real problem areas are that we have, which right now, especially given the Flower Mound report, I still am convinced that, you know, the, the, the internal combustion motor is only 17% efficient in terms of pushing a car down the road. The rest of it goes off as heat and as waste products. And I'm convinced we have to do something there in addition to always using a resource most wisely. So getting back to your issue, um, I think that data will not only be able to look at which uh, facilities, gas facilities, are being operated inefficiently, which means a waste of a resource, but also it will give us a better idea, and, and it has to be set up well like the companies did down there, the consulting firms did down there, uh, where you can look for areas where there are thought to be concerns and even compare them to areas where it's not expected to be or better ambient air. Thank you. And, and I have a add-on question. Uh, the Flower Mound study, um, did they uh, have any water <coughs> testing component? No. no, this is all air. Okay, so if we have a directive to <coughs> staff to create uh, such, a, uh, as similar as we can get, a testing program for water quality, that would be far ahead of our neighbor to the south. Correct. In my, yeah. Thank you. Oh, can I say one more thing? Please. Uh, the noise section was very good. We got an A on that. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We're used to a lot of noise, <laughs> so we're used to that one. Okay, the next speaker is Andrew May, to be followed by Cynthia Talbot. Hello, I'm Andrew May, 1824 Concord Lane in Denton, and um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the council for the opportunity to join this conversation. Um, I, I'm also uh, uh, here to request uh, that you go back yet again to the drawing board and uh, try to strengthen this uh, ordinance. 
I've read through it, obviously uh, um, not understanding all of it and uh, trying to understand as much as I could, and comparing it also with uh, similar ordinances that I could find from uh, other municipalities. And it seemed to me that uh, there are a few ways in which it could be made uh, stronger, some of which have been mentioned, and including the uh, uh, setback requirements, um, the uh, criteria for uh, variances, including also um, the, uh, I, I was actually surprised to hear the previous speaker say that the noise uh, that uh, she would give an A, I'm uh, a musician, and I, I think that 65 decibels is a pretty substantial noise level in a residential area uh, at your home. So I would uh, urge you to look into that. Um, and also the zoning uh, issues, that it seems that a lot of uh, municipalities are being more careful about where they'll allow these things to happen. And I realize that there's uh, always a question of uh, what is enforceable and also what will be challenged in a court of law, but I, I would uh, urge you to uh, feel powerful to use the full extent of your powers as a home rule city to uh, uh, preserve what is really a, a wonderful, wonderful place to live. And I think that our greatest resource is uh, the, uh, the people of Denton, the uh, livability of the city, and uh, our identity as a community. And it would be a really sad thing to uh, take uh, any unnecessary risk with that. So to the extent I, I guess I'd like to um, give essentially an econo economic argument that uh, the Barnett show has been there a long time and uh, it'll wait for us. Um, there are plenty of uh, places that uh, can be uh, more or less expensive to drill in and I think that it's our right uh, if we wish to, to say well our economy is doing all right, our community is doing all right, uh, we can afford to wait and uh, uh, hold off on granting permits until we believe that due diligence has been uh, uh, applied and that uh, we know what we need to know to feel that we're protecting our community. So uh, I, I really uh, urge you to uh, not be in a rush to conclude this process, although it must be agonizing and maddening to continue day after day, week after week. But uh, please be patient and keep on trying to figure out ways to slow down the uh, exploitation of resources that will wait for us in order to do it in the safest possible way. And thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cynthia Talbot, followed by Morgan Larson. Sorry, unfortunate softball accident. Uh, don't, no depth perception. Cynthia Talbot, 1011 Panhandle. Um, I wanted to start off by letting you know that uh, I come here as a citizen of Denton, uh, very new to this town. Uh, I finally moved back here. I got my bachelor's degree here more years ago than I want to think about. Uh, and I brought my whole family with me up into including my grandmother who is 94 years old and now living at a nursing home here in, in your city. And I hope to stay here for a long time. On that note, I am a registered sanitarian <coughs> with the state of Texas. And uh, I, I'm used to dealing with city councils and I know how hard it is <laughs> to get an ordinance passed the way you want it to be. But I can say that uh, if it's possible, for example, the city of Plano to pass a food ordinance that is much stricter than ours, and it's possible for the city of Flower Mound or the city of South Lake to pass a dueling ordinance that is much stricter than ours, then obviously it is possible as a home rule jurisdiction for the city of Denton to pass such an ordinance. And I really appreciate that what Dr. Banks was talking about earlier. My question was, and maybe this has been addressed, I said I just moved back to Denton after quite a while out. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the problems that fracking can cause with already existing wells that have been drilled. Uh, I know they're only minor quakes, but uh, even according to Governor Perry and the Texas State Legislature, the cement sheaths, steel casing, and clay plugs of existing historical wells are in Texas are in great danger of failing within the next decade or so, and any minor earthquakes can severely add to this issue of large underground storage tanks that have been blocked up 20, 30 years ago, rupturing and adding to the groundwater pollution that we're concerned with on other methods. There are 400, no, 4,412 
known historical wells and tanks in Denton County. So how many of those have been tested to see what state the existing plugs are in at this point and has the issue of added strain on these existing historical wells even been considered in addition that fracking is going to put on these tanks that we have inherited from less uh, structurally uh, sound practices 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, I, like I said, I've just come to this uh, city, so I'm not sure if this has been addressed. I know it's an issue, and I'm currently the health inspector with the city of Highland Village, and as one of the people charged with inspecting these sorts of things uh, from a uh, Lake City's area of water and wastewater runoff, as well you know, uh, it's an issue we're having. So uh, I understand I can, you can't answer that question, but I urge you to consider it uh, as an issue going forward uh, with the changes that you're going to be making to this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mor Morgan Larson, followed by um, Candace Burned or Burno. Good evening. My name is Morgan Larson. I live off of McCormick. I will not give my full address until everybody in city council gives their full address because I know that not everybody lives within the Denton city limits. And maybe that is why what we have to sit here and do this every single time. Because you don't live here. You do, some of you don't live here. Um, maybe that's why you don't care. Uh, maybe that's why you sit on this council and pretend to hear us and pretend to care because you, you don't. We have come here time after time and we have given you multiple resources and the people before me are completely correct. You have been pandering to industry people. That is who you've gotten to take this information and you all are well, well aware of that. And why are you all well, well aware of that? Why do you sit there behind closed doors and listen to these people talk to you? It's because of industry. It is because of money. It is because of profit. So as you see children in this, <laughs> in this audience, as you see young adults and as you see the elderly, as you see veterans and as you see disabled people, think about their health. Five wells near Geyer? Are you kidding me? Six, thank you, six. And as somebody who has a particular medical condition that I don't want to release, it is abominable. I went to my gynecologist out in the hospital park near Bonnie Bray, and as I looked out the window getting my pap smear, what did I see? The, <laughs> the Razor Ranch frack well. What a great thing to look at as you are getting your pap smear. Uh, I can't help but think that there's going to be more of that in the future. This, this, all this was was pandering as this person, I believe he is the, the city manager, is pandering. <laughs> you guys were just pandering to him. I, I completely stand in solidarity with everybody who has come before me. It's com been completely disrespectful. We have brought you multiple uh, resources about what to do with this community. I have also recently been accepted to be a part of the class of the Denton Master Gardeners Association, and I am a 20-something in a class of 60-something, and I am very proud of that, and I consider myself to be a future farmer of Denton. I work with Earthwise, I work with Denton Backyard Farms, and as that video showed from Ponder, Texas, I also work with Cardo. And there is no way that we can have a sustainable food system in Denton, Texas with, with fracking. That is period, end of subject. And that is something that makes the Denton community market so beautiful. I also volunteer with 35 Denton. I plan on being here for a very long time. I'm from Garland, Texas, and I've got my degree here in, in Denton because I love this place and I love these people and I care about them and even though you guys don't live here and you're, lis and you're listening to f people who who will allow fracking. I love you too and I care about 
everyone here. And that's why I'm here today to tell you to don't frack with Denton. The evidence is there. Be strong. I'm sorry I'm going to go over my, 30, my three minutes because you guys don't allow us to speak either. You guys sit behind closed door meetings and allow somebody to talk to you without us talking to you. We are here because we have to be. I'm here because I have to be. There is no other choice. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I can move. What about the people who are homeless? What about the people who cannot you can afford? I, you're going to have to escort I me. I will not. I, I will always not. afford everyone the chance. What about those who cannot afford? What about those who are homeless, who do not have the ability, who are not here, the, dis the disabled veterans? What about their health? Are we providing a space for them? We are not. And I recognize this you're not concluding, so I, I appreciate not, your stance. I will not stop. And I'll have to ask her to be escorted from the room. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Candace Burned or Bur Burno, followed by McMullen Kahey? Kathy. Kathy. It's Kathy McMullen. Oh, Kathy. Oh, I She's see. Awesome. There should be a link. Also, it's Candace Burned. I live at 412 Half Fry Street. Um, I'm not wearing green because I forgot, but <laughs> I'm totally a Denton fossil fuel person. Um, so yeah, I've been living in Denton for all of my co college career. I'm a recent graduate, um, and I've been w struggling against fracking for some time now. I took a short hiatus, but I remember three years ago when the um, Razor Ranch well was first going up across the street from the park um, where little children play. That was when I first got involved, when my boyfriend at the time organized the community over there on Panhandle Street in that neighborhood area. Um, to speak out against what was going on. And we went door to door um, and spoke to people about it. And overwhelmingly, people are against this. And I've watched, I've sat through a lot of these meetings now, and every single time, the majority of people are against this, are against fracking. <sighs> I've seen so many things at these meetings. I've seen um, what I call an astroturf funded group get up here, not say where they lived, not say their address before y'all, and advocate for fracking when they were an industry funded group um, from Fort Worth. They were about the only ones I've ever seen in this city speak up for fracking and for everything that was, you know, going on. Um, during the task force meetings, I've seen a bumbling of arguments and things that threw me off most of the time. But it feels strange to be here now because of it's just been so long. It's been years. And um, you all, I, I actually had a meeting, um, I don't know if you remember, with you and my friend Liz. Um, we talked to you about um, why, you know, it's not possible to ban fracking. And what always comes up is mineral rights. and state law. That always seems to be the fallback. We can't do it because of mineral rights. We can't do it because of property rights. Um, but I don't think that's really true. I think that if you raise the insurance policy that you would basically implement an indirect ban. And that's what we want you to do. We want you to raise the insurance policy. It doesn't have to be 25 million. It could be 15 million. And that's what some other cities have done. And I think that that's what should be done. And I think that a lot of people would agree. Um, you, you make it impossible because you're confined in these little lines of thought that say, like, this is how the system works and we have to be within these lines. But nothing is impossible. You can do this if you want to. And lastly, I just want to speak about climate change because I haven't heard anybody bring that up. Let's say that this regulation is the awesomest ever and um, all of our water is great and somehow magically, you know, nothing's going to happen with our health, which isn't true. Um, you still have climate change, and that's what we care about. We care about the fact that no matter what, fracking, it may burn cleaner than coal, but it's still a fossil fuel, and it still is putting carbon into the air. The very process of fracking releases methane, which is a stronger greenhouse gas than carbon. And if we continue down the path where we're fracking, and this is, this is the resources that we're using for our energy, we're going to see disastrous effects of climate change. It's real. Like, you can't deny it. It's... The, all the science is there. There's an intergovernmental panel 
of scientists with a scientific consensus that this is happening and it's happening because of humans. And if you um, can bring to a conclusion. No, I'm not going to be bringing it to a conclusion today because I, like everybody else, have been here too long to abide by your three-minute rule. So you'll have to escort me out. But back to climate change. <laughs> and recognizing that's not leading towards a conclusion, um, I would ask that you be escorted out, and I appreciate your comments. Kathy McMullen, and then followed by Kelsey Fryman. Tables to the council. I went over all of the things that were on the national side. I'm hoping your response to those questions that I have a problem with. My name is Kathy McMullen. I live at 805 Hector. I am speaking today in solidarity with those citizens of Denton who are opposed to a weak ordinance and who demand greater protections from a polluting industry. I'm going to, address, going to address responses to the drilling administrator's reasons for refusal to implement DAG's recommendations. The first, why can't we simply prohibit venting and flaring? The most absurd response of the day goes to flaring is often referred to as a green completion. The second runner-up is the new draft language could be considered an improvement. The new ordinance does not ban flaring. The new ordinance allows flaring up to 10 days as allowed by the Texas Railroad Commission. In May of 2012, the Texas Railroad Commission announced they wanted to ensure the current rules regarding flaring were being followed. The agency also stated that the regulations ought to ensure flaring of fracking gases as a last resort. That's the Texas Railroad Commission. Banning compressor stations. First, I don't think it is appropriate to use the unofficial official task force as a basis for allowing compressor stations. During the time the mayor was running for re-election, he repeatedly said the task force would be used as a fact-finding tool and not used to design the ordinances specifically. Just because the Railroad Commission of Texas is granted certain regulatory authority on in-state common carrier pipelines, that has nothing to do with the municipalities being able to ban compressors or zone them under their home rule authority. What about the recommendations from the minority report? If the city of Denton does not have the foresight of South Lake to ban this heavy industrial use from residential areas within the city, can't we at least regulate it? There are no noise, emission, or aesthetic limitations. Why can't compressor stations only be in heavy industrial use areas with sound compression buildings around it? Compression stations only have to be every 40 to 100 miles, and lift compressors can be used if the pressure in a pipeline drops too low. Lift compressors are less intrusive and used for intermediate, intermediate periods of time. The huge noisy compressor stations are here forever. Vapor recovery units only required in certain circumstances. The certain circumstances are never addressed in the answer to this question. I have been not been able to find a documented case of an explosion related to a vapor recovery <coughs> unit. Dish Texas has vapor recovery units on its storage tank and I have not heard of any explosions related to their equipment. According to current research regarding compressor-based vapor recovery units, any liquids produced collect in a knockout post and return to the condensate storage tank. The compressors are equipped, with, are equipped with pressurized sensors and bypass capacity to prevent pulling a vacuum on the storage tank and thereby creating an explosion. I believe it is more a matter of industry not wanting to pay the upfront cost and that is, this is not important to me or anyone else I know. Clean air and water, a good quality of life is important, not a company's profit margins. The 1,500-foot setback causes a 162-acre circle around every protected use area, thereby causing a regulatory taking has never been demonstrated in any meeting I've participated in. My question is, doesn't Flower Mound have 1,500-foot setbacks, and don't those encompass 162 acres also? Flower Mound consists of 27,000 acres, while Denton consists of 57,000 acres. So the rationale is with twice as much acreage, Denton is more likely to get sued than Flower Mound. That does not make sense. Also, the next argument that Denton measures setbacks from the edge of a drilling and production site and most cities measure from the wellhead is also false. Flower Mound and many other cities measure from the edge of a production site. And Ms. McMullen, Denton you deserves 1,500-foot setbacks. Why leak detection and compliance plan was removed? 
If you see below, they give us the reason of property owners may not desire to know what constitutes their water well. This did not address what we were asking for. I, I don't why sense the, that you're concluding. <laughs> why we, we were the water well right testing requirements removed? Private so property owners may not be desired. The mic be cut off and be escorted. Thank you. Kelsey Freiman, followed by Adam Briggle. Hi, my name is Kelsey Freiman, and recent address change, uh, 903 McCormick Street. Uh, Y'all, some of you know me right now. You're a little bit new, so you don't know that I'm the mean one, actually. Um, I'm not nice. Everyone else comes up here and talks about ordinances, and I think last time I was up here I called you terrorists, which is admittedly not that off when you take money for our health. Um, and actually, as a side note, it is Dr. King's birthday, so, and as he is one of the people who has helped me with my oration, I really feel like I need to honor that. I also feel like I need to honor the legacy of someone who fought and died doing things like civil rights movement and labor movement work. Um, that's my R Walmart shirt, because I spent my Thanksgiving out on picket lines with striking Walmart workers because I actually care about people. And when I say that I care about people, I don't mean in the abstract, like, yay, hugs for everyone. I mean in that I don't want them to be poisoned. And when you bring in an industry like the natural gas industry that allows for poisoning of people, allows their water to be tainted, allows their air to come into contact with all sorts of nasty chemicals, we've given you report after report after report of these, what do you think that I think of you? Um, I think that a brilliant idea for the ordinance would also be to have them pay for the medical expenses that they cause. If you continue to poison me and end up causing me to have cancer or, or some other ailment like asthma that's a chronic condition that you have to go and constantly get inhalers for and constantly go to the doctor's office, <laughs> well, you should be liable for that. I mean, if I hit someone with a car and they break their leg, I'm liable for their medical insurance. Why are they not liable for my health when they're the ones hurting it? <laughs> at times, I'm actually at a loss because we keep coming up here and even though I know that industry gets to go behind closed doors, I mean, I've sat outside the closed door meetings and seen industry executives, and I've seen the people in suits who cost more than my tuition, and I've seen the people keep coming in and keep telling you all sorts of interesting things, but that the science doesn't quite match up. Uh, I've, I'm done. Like, every time I come up here, I get more and more frustrated, and I start to lose my train of thought and start to lose where I'm going because, well, it's my health. I want to live here. I love being around Denton. I love the people that come here. I love the people that I'm around. I love the community that it's based in. But what I really hate is that I have to argue that I shouldn't be killed. I have to argue that I shouldn't be poisoned, and I have to argue and argue about my health and of other people's health, and that you're taking blood money from an industry that is actively <laughs> killing us. We're all up here coughing, and I've seen asthma after asthma case develop. I've seen people say, well, what about coal? Well, for every million dollars you invest in natural gas, you get five jobs. It's all about the economy, right? You get five jobs for every million dollars that you invest in natural gas. And if you can you get conclude. Cool story, bro. You don't respect me. You don't respect my time. You don't respect the people I'm in. So why should I respect you? I believe in a quid pro quo respect form. If you continue to disrespect me by continuing to pretend like the ordinance that you're putting into place are strong enough to have aspect. Why should I respect your time? You don't respect me as a human being. Well, clearly you're not concluding, so I, well, I would have to so ask to um, cut off the mic and escort this person out. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Adam Briggle, followed by Amber Briggle. Hi, 
Hi, uh, Adam Briggle, 1315 Dartmouth Place. Um, I gotta say tonight, you've restored my, f my faltering faith in the system. I wanna thank you for coming out tonight swinging. Um, I, I think that you have listened to our concerns and I appreciate that. So I, uh, and I also wanna thank everybody here who's I think hopefully helped push us forward in this direction. So I've totally changed my remarks on the basis of what I heard briefly in the work session and on what you said a little bit more on your questions. And so I want to just limit my remarks now to a few sort of ad lib off the cuff, hopefully helpful suggestions to what it seems like you're cooking up, which again, I wholly endorse in spirit. Uh, as for the compressor stations, something we've been asking for a long time, thank you for, uh, for putting that in. I think I just say ditto to what Vicky said and some of Kathy's uh, remarks as well. I agree using our zoning powers is probably the best strategy here and whether there's uh, more ways to do it in addition to setbacks and noise I know you can put some structures around these things maybe, so that's worth some more research. Um, venting and flaring, you know, I wonder if we couldn't at least eliminate that variance that would allow it even closer to protected uses in residential areas. If you look at the draft ordinance, not only can it happen a thousand feet away, but it seems like we give a, a, an option to make it even closer. Could we not at least take that out? What I'd really like to see is just prohibit venting and flaring. Now I understand that they have to do it at times, but it's only, it, it would only be in emergencies if they have to pay a $2,000 a day fine for doing it. Right? They're, they're gonna pay that fine rather than blow up all their equipment. But it, it's, it's a way of saying we don't, we don't think that's an appropriate sort of thing to do in our community. Um, so if that's an option. Um, now as for, I think the most important thing maybe I could say about air and water monitoring. Again, thank you for considering that. I'm hesitant. Um, because maybe I don't understand the model you're talking about, I would prefer that you follow what South Lake did and I can get you the exact language from their <laughs> ordinance. But I think it should be written into the ordinance rather than something on the side. It would make it clear to everybody involved. Um, and I also think it should be continual because of the, I, I had a long conversation with members of Devon and they had, one of the things they did admit to me is that valves in these storage tanks can get stuck occasionally and then you can have a major sort of venting episode but that doesn't happen all the time. And so if you're only sampling now and again, you might miss that. And so South Lake has continual monitoring, which I think is important. They also require it to be streamed online and people can see that. You know, one of the reasons to do this is to get the data for it and to get the people to understand what's happening to the air and water around them. Um, so I, again, just encourage you to look at South Lake and I can get you that language. Finally, I think zoning this whole business industrial is really the long game. And I'm in it, if you guys are in it, to to look at this in a long-term strategy to zone everything industrial. If you look at uh, the laterals, the horizontal laterals the industry is, is doing now, they're up to an average of a mile long and they're going up by 400 feet a year in Denton County. That means it's gonna be feasible, I think, to do this just from industrial zones. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Roden has a question. Dr. Briggle, thank you for your service uh, throughout this process from beginning to end. Uh, mo most of the issues we're addressing have come from the DAG group uh, that have continually been putting things and educating us and the rest of the community, so I appreciate that. I did have a question relating to um, your air, air quality uh, questions. Why is it important to you that it goes in the ordinance versus being, in, in other words, what's, what's your goal with it that having it in the ordinance is preferable to having it as another part of the policy of our inspections? Uh, I, I think it's just I don't understand the other model. Gotcha. So I, I'll have to get educated on that. Right. I mean, it just it's it's clear if it's in the ordinance and everybody who's involved in, in a, getting permits for the activity knows what's going on. But if there's another way, look, I'm, I'm open to learning about it. And if you can convince me uh, it's superior, then gotcha. okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Council Member Gregory has a question. Uh, I just also wanted to offer my thanks for the work that you've done, for the work that DAG's done. I want to thank you for abiding by the time limit. And thank you for acknowledging that uh, there really is a, uh, um, a good faith effort on the part of all of the council members to um, continue to find ways to take the drafts and improve the ordinance. Yeah, well thank you all. I, I really believe that you guys are trying your best in a very complex situation and tonight I saw some very encouraging things, so thank you. Thank you very much. Amber Burgle, to be followed by Timothy Ruchero.
Good evening, I'm Amber Briggle. I live with my smarty pants husband on Dartmouth Place. Um, I'm speaking today in solidarity with the citizens of Denton who are opposed to this weak ordinance and who demand greater protection from polluting industry. I wasn't even sure if I was going to come tonight. I'm actually paying someone $10 an hour to tuck my babies in and read them bedtime stories. This is not where I want to be. Um, especially given that over the last year and a half, I feel like I've done almost everything in my power to tell y'all what kind of ordinance I'd really like to see. And I understand the legal framework in which we're working, and I've never really asked for an outright ban. I feel like the requests I've made and the ideas that I've shared have been reasonable given the complex situation we find ourselves in. But I feel like my voice is still not represented in this ordinance yet. Flaring, vested rights, compressor stations, inadequate setbacks. I've challenged all of these things time and again, and they're still here. <laughs> I really believe that all of you sitting up there tonight are good and decent people. I really believe that. I believe you honestly want the best for Denton. And I know a lot of you personally. I'm inspired by your commitment to this community. You're my friends, and I'm grateful for your service. But I feel that this current draft is weak and uninspired. And I feel like you've somehow lost your way. 18 months ago, when first mapping out this process, I felt like you all showed a lot of creativity. You were asking the right kinds of questions. You laid out what kind of forums you wanted held, which voices you wanted to hear, which committees would get a chance to work on this before it came back to you. And then the train left the station and left you behind. What we have now does not represent the people, nor does it represent you. This is not what you asked for. And somehow during this process, you've stopped being leaders and became the ones who are now being led. You've been led by fear. You've been led by doubt. You've been led by the pressure of a self-imposed timeline. And I'm here to tell you tonight it's not too late to regain your control over this. I think the questions uh, that were made at the beginning of this, of this uh, agenda item were very encouraging for me, and I, I, uh, I hope that you continue along that track. I feel that you must ask for a second opinion on legal matters. I think there's a lot of gray area left to be defined, and one legal opinion is not going to be enough. You need to workshop this more this time with different voices and find out just what makes us so damn different from Flower Mound and South Lake that we can't have the same protections that they have. That's unfair. And so I call upon, on the inspiration of a real visionary, a man whose very life was in danger for standing up for what he believed in, Thomas Jefferson, when he said, I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. I get it. I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. Are we going to be chained to an industry that enslaves us with their exploitative and polluting practices? I say no. I prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Timothy Ruggiero, followed by John Russell. Mr. Mayor, Council, good evening. My name is Timothy Ruggiero. I used to reside in Wise County, and as a result of living there, I now reside at 10037 uh, Copeland Place in Pilot Point, um, just up a few miles up the road. Um, and I will try very hard to stick my three minutes. Um, as a conservative, I tend not to be in favor of regulations that restrict and stifle our local economy. However, given the more than 2,300 violations in 2011 alone and a record 829 violations in December. I think it's fair to say that the current regulations obviously are not strong enough and the repeated violations on the same sites or by the same operators suggest little incentive for the operators to comply. Please stop consulting with the industry for answers and work to the benefit of those who have to live with this dangerous and deceptive industry. If you don't think that they're deceptive, I would refer you to a commercial on TV that you've probably all seen. It features Chad. He claims to live and work in industry in Salina, Texas. There is no production in Salina, Texas. 
If that's not deception, I don't know what is. If you don't think that it's dangerous and there's no problems with drilling, why are there so many problems with drilling? If you think the economy is more important than the environment, try holding your breath when reviewing the city budget. As a result of my experience in Decatur, I am a co-founder of Shale Test along with Mayor Tillman, uh, who produced, amongst many things, the, one of the videos that you saw tonight. We do environmental testing for low-income families. The demand far outweighs our ability to do the testing. My hope is that one day there is very little demand for it. So please consider that and explore the facts and all the information that you can and consider the source of the information of where you're getting the information from when it comes to building this ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. And John Russell, followed by Virginia Simonson. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there a question? I'm sorry. Hi, I'm John Russell from 2302 Jacqueline Drive. Um, this is my wife, Batavia. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, she can get to fill out a card. If you want, I could get a card, or if she could speak after me, it'd be fine. Uh, if it's an indulgence to, um, if you don't, you have her fill out a card while he's speaking, then maybe. All right, cool, thank you. From an order standpoint, if you don't mind, to let, let them follow each other. So. <sighs> Um, I'm sort of an unwilling expert on pollution. I uh, come from the uh, lovely state of New Jersey where pollution is about as common as really good pizza and extremely tragic hair. Um, <clears throat> one of the um, schools that I got to do some student teaching at was School 22 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And it was about a stone's throw away from the Exxon plant. And the uh, children weren't able to play outside on the playground, um, especially when the wind blew a certain way. Um, and there was a large air filtration system that looked like it was the size of a full story of the building on top of this one-story building that had to be built by the Exxon company so that the children could breathe fresh air in the school. Um, now, when I heard that they were going to be doing some drilling and fracking uh, around the area of the Dina Park neighborhood, I wasn't happy, but I don't think that that probably would have gotten me to come out to these meetings. It was the location of one specific well right by Frank Borman Elementary that kind of made me say, hey, we want to adopt a kid. When we do, he's going to go to that school. We just, we want to take care of our kid. So I want to give something specific as a possible thing to consider because I realize it's complicated. I know that you're trying to make a law that will stand up against a challenge that a Texas judge would find it difficult, if not very politically awkward to strike down the law and that you're, you're really pushing as hard as you feel you can. A and I appreciate that you're working in good faith. So allow me to suggest that uh, the setbacks um, that you have in place, if you feel that that's the most that you can do, double the setbacks in a radius around all public and private schools and all daycares where there is a concentration of children because you have a legal precedent for that with your um, drug-free school zones already. We have entire maps <coughs> around Denton where if you reside in that house and you're making a different kind of air pollution that smells sweet and the police catch you, you get, uh, you get double fined. Uh, you, you, get, you get whacked really hard. And so if there is an environmental infraction within those zones, 
maybe you could actually come up with higher penalties since it is in an area that's around children. I don't want to take up any more of your time, but thank you. I'm hoping very much that you remember the last time I was up here speaking. My Have name you? is Batavia Russell, and I live at 2302 Jacqueline Drive. <laughs> You can go ahead. I did. My name and address. Please start my time. You can go ahead and talk. Thank you. You get free time. Then. <laughs> it's good. what it feels like to hold a seven-week-old baby in your arms that stops breathing. That's what it feels like. An absolute eternity of waiting and watching a clock and thinking, what is going to happen? I don't ever want to hold my child and have that happen. And it has happened to me with someone else's child. Please, do not let them drill behind my child's elementary school. Please. Thank you. Virginia. Virginia Simonson, to be followed by Elma Walker. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Virginia Simonson. Although I'm a resident of Flower Mound, Texas, I spend a great deal of time in Denton working with Denton County Veterans Coalition and also with the, the DAG group. In fact, I think I spend most of my waking time in Denton, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. I'm an Army veteran, and I've learned many things over the course of my 24-year career. Uh, I'd like to apply some of these lessons learned, actually three tonight, as you consider the most important elements of your revised drilling ordinance. First, discuss the bottom line up front. Second, always apply a rigorous cost-benefit analysis to every decision of consequence you make. Three, remember that good leaders listen to their people, they take care of their people, and they strive to do what's right over what's expedient. And I, I've uh, got quite a bit to talk about, 
but I just want to say a couple of things up front. Uh, first, I want to uh, reiterate what Sharon Wilson said. You guys are, have been getting a lot of bad information. Um, for instance, the city of South Lake does in fact ban compressor stations in city limits. Uh, the city of Bedford does in fact since 2008 ban compression stations, compression facilities in the city of Bedford. So it can be done. Uh, the city of Grand Prairie was sued by Texas Midstream uh, a couple of years ago. It made it through the uh, district court, the appellate court, and the appellate court affirmed for the city of Grand Prairie on everything except a safety issue which had to do with putting up a fence around the compression station. Yes, compressors do connect to the, the, the grid, the pipeline, interstate and intrastate, but that does not take away your home rule authority to cite these or to prohibit them altogether. The other thing I'd like to talk about real quickly um, as a citizen of Flower Mound is that, yes, we do have uh, air monitoring. It's regular because the citizens demanded it. Um, it is actually reflected in our ordinance, uh, not as rigorously as we would have liked. Basically, if uh, an operator is found to have been out of compliance by TCEQ or EPA, then they have to uh, submit a mandatory emissions plan, but nothing until then. As a citizen of Flower Mound, I don't believe that I should have to pay out of my property taxes for the city to administer an air quality, air monitoring system. And it's it is pretty extensive, um, and they've been doing it since 2010. It it's done monthly. Uh, I learned today because of the good citizens of uh, Denton shared with me uh, Eagle Ridge's, um, I guess, submission to, uh, to you all about Flower Mounds Air Quality. I learned that one of the most important compounds that we used to monitor for, carbon disulfide, was removed from uh, the testing uh, criteria. Uh, I also want to let you know uh, that I did send a, uh, a note to my mayor and my council members about that as well as uh, letting them know that uh, they're the poster child for something called ambient air testing, which really does nothing to tell you how much emissions are affecting a, a given population. When I leave here, I'm gonna give you a document that actually talks about that. In Flower Mound, we look at ambient air quality, which is different, um, and we have a history of putting the monitors upwind from the, the site of the gas production, which means the wind is not blowing from the gas uh, facilities to the monitor. So it is unusual to find problems. Although we've had benzene exceedances, uh, the highest in fact on the Barnett Shale at 8.63 parts per billion back in uh, January of 2011, the highest that the Barnett, Barnett Shale had seen. So monitoring is a very tricky thing. Don't think that it's okay you know, to have ambient air monitoring and think you've solved the problems. And Thank you. your citizens should not have to pay for the profits of the gas companies. I'm gonna leave uh, uh, Mr. Roden with a bunch of stuff because he seemed like the most, uh, the biggest guy uh, and a proponent of the citizens here. And basically I just wanna let if, you if know you just hand, how hand much, it, hand uh, it to the city secretary how much the profits forward. that the companies in Denton are making Thank and you. who actually owns your minerals. Um, so I, I'd like that to be reflected. Take a look. Thank at you very much. It's, it's eye Thank you. Elma Walker, followed by Megan Story. Elma Walker, 9805 Grandview. I've had to redo my card so many times. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to get this right, let alone within three minutes. But. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for improving our gas spell ordinance. It's better than it was. I'm glad that you addressed pre-drilling and post-drilling water well testing. Uh, hopefully the costs will be passed on to the operator, but performed independent of those companies, and I agree with Adam that I would like to see those inspection department duties that we've uh, added onto his list uh, be put in the ordinance or in writing. We don't want anything to happen once you've all moved on when term limits hit. Um, I appreciate your insertion of uh, comp compression stations into the ordinance now. That compression station that you saw up there is the same one I sent to you, and you know where that is. It's just outside my neighborhood, right next to an eight uh, acre uh, frack lake and uh, an ejection well. And that's in Ponder, uh, probably Ponder ETJ, I'm guessing. 
Uh, that would be a great place to put up a continuous monitoring station in our neighborhood uh, because that would give you the opportunity to learn about air pollution from compressor stations. Um, I know a little bit about them and I could share that with you, but I don't want to take the time right now. Uh, how about no compressor sta compression station batteries like in DISH? How about rezoning to allow them only in heavy industrial zoning? Um, or at least making that strong suggestion deciding ahead where that would be. Uh, that leads to my next comment. Our secretary passed out my slightly revised suggestions for a pipeline and associated facilities ordinance, which by the way would uh, include compressor stations, Fort Worth, um, Flower Mound, Keller, South Lake, and West Lake all have pipeline ordinances. Please have uh, Mr. Gross Department provide you with a chart of those city's provisions. Um, we appreciate um, all that you have started and including um, you know what you've done with the ordinance and including the moratorium. I do recognize that Denton is not South Lake and Flower Mound. We are different. Um, you are evidently problem solvers and that's I appreciate that. Um, we need to have our Denton development plans consider zoning regulations for heavy industrial uh, and we want them to take into consideration phase one, phase two and pipeline and their associated facilities as well. Uh, let's not wait any more before it becomes too late as a home rule city. You can do this stuff now. And please revisit the gas well ordinance about every five years. Uh, it's like childbirth. You will forget the pain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your service, and we appreciate you. Thank you. And there's a question. Councilmember Gregory, Alma? No, my Alma? question's not for her. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. But it does have to do with pain. How many more people are going to speak, or can we have a break? Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I eight, want to hear them all, nine, but I can't ten, sit here any longer. Eleven. There. Can we okay, have a break? Let us have a break till quarter till. Try to be prompt. Then we are temporarily adjourned. Pardon me, um, the, if everyone could take a seat, sorry about that. Uh, we are restarting our meeting and I am um, ready to call the next speakers. Uh, the first one is Megan Story and uh, Megan will be file, followed by Daniel Watts. Hello City hey. Council. Um, my name is Megan Story. I live at 804 West Hickory Street. I am speaking today in solidarity with those citizens of Denton who are opposed to this weak ordinance and who demand greater protections from a polluting industry. Um, it's really hard for me to speak at these things, but I do anyway. Um, maybe you can tell by the quiver in my voice that I'm nervous, um, and maybe it's because you know, the, the building is constructed in a way that, um, you know, promotes this idea of superiority on this side um, or, you know, that I'm only allotted three minutes to speak. Um, but uh, I do want to work in solidarity with all of you um, and I want you all to stand with me um, and uh, I want to demand um, the strictest regulations possible to, um, to prevent fracking from happening in Denton. Um, I don't really understand why there have been so many demands to have um, this ordinance amended and then continually feeling confused as to why it hasn't been. I'm just, um, I'm just trying to, f to figure out where the loyalty and honesty lies. I, I can't 
I can't read minds. Um, all I can do is just, you know, voice my concerns for my current understanding of the situation. Um, um, <coughs> my family lives in Denton. Um, I love it. It's it's a gem, and we know that. Um, obviously, everyone here feels that way. There's so many people here. This is a huge. This is a very packed um, session, uh, and I think members who ordinarily wouldn't, uh, you know, in participate in an act of civil disobedience have tonight because they feel like they haven't been listened to, um, and so I, f I find that very interesting. And I think large groups of people like this can feel when there isn't something, something isn't right. And I guess I want to know, um, I guess, I guess I'm just confused by the process, but what I want to say is, I want to read um, from the the DAG um, suggestions, just a couple suggestions um, for a better ordinance. Um, the prohibition of uh, compressor stations uh, to prohibit venting and flaring, um, to require air and water quality monitoring, um, strengthen uh, the SUP process, increase setbacks to 1,500 feet, zone drilling and fracking um, as industrial uses, um, the prohibition of compressor stations um, I think is really important. It's brought up a couple been brought up a couple times tonight. And if if you could s conclude. Um, I'm also going to ergo the three-minute time limit. Um, I, I'm getting back to the prohibition of compressor stations, other cities have done this. These polluting industrial machines will be more prevalent. And I, as I recognize and respect what you're doing, uh, but I recognize also you're not concluding, so I'll have to ask to cut off the mic and to escort you from the room. Thank you very much for your comments. Daniel, uh, D Daniel Watts, to be followed by Jennifer Lane, I believe. Jennifer Lane. I'm Daniel Watts of 516 West Oak Street, and I thank you for your time and considering and uh, to listen to me. Um, we share the same last name, Watts. My mother's last name, maiden name is Campbell. Could have been family. Who knows? <laughs> it seems as though we are now at a monumentous transitional state in not only the city of Denton, but the whole world. <coughs> at some point, the majority of us will have to recognize the imperative nature of these changes and how they will affect our lives and our community. We can already see clearly the effect that corporate level action on the ecological status has, with, has on the weather that we experience uh, lately in extreme conditions. You've seen it. To bring it to more uh, uh, immediate and local level in terms of gas well drilling uh, and the analyses that it necessitates uh, and the cost of this type of action that, that, that seemed to grow exponentially, speaking monetarily and in the value of life itself. For example, the effect of air changes from something like flaring caused by the burning of harmful gas hits home with me personally. Because I have a condition I was diagnosed with called costochondritis. Uh, it, has, um, it affects my lungs, it's inflammation of the lungs. And um, it's extremely painful when in the presence of chemicals, toxicities, and particulates in the air. And, um, I can't even go into a venue to see a band play if they allow smoking in the venue. And I'm a musician, so I have to be very selective of where I play. And uh, I understand this condition is a personal issue, um, but it is one of many cases that are affected as a result of tampering with the homeostasis of the elements that we can't, can't help but have to rely on. Air, water, earth, into we are deeply integrated into this. Uh, 
I mean, in this ecosystem where change is made, there's change in us. And we can't help that. We are connected. With these changes, it's going to require maturity in our community to wake up to what is really happening here. We can't stand idly by and allow the ground to, uh, to beneath us to be tampered with right under our feet. I urge you to consider the source, the source of the, in, uh, the intentions of the cases or the ones who are making these careless, selfish decisions to our planet. Each of, us, each of you probably has access to a network to the internet. Uh, I urge you, uh, it contains almost unfathomable amount of information, almost anything you want to know about. I urge you to research everything you can in order to better the under and understand the kind of situation we're in. The pits is, are just as the title suggests, the pits. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Lane, followed by Tara Lynn Hunter. Hello, my name is Jennifer Lane. I live at 2024 Bowling Green. And I'm speaking today because um, one thing that hasn't been brought up yet is, well, two things really. One is just the changes in Denton that have happened in the last six to seven years that are so remarkable and wonderful here. Um, as a person who's lived here during that period, um, transplant from larger cities, um, I thought when I moved here to teach at the University of North Texas that I would love the school and be a little bit unhappy with the city, but I, the opposite, if anything. The, the city of Denton is fantastic. And the College of Music at uh, the University of North Texas is also quite wonderful and international. And I want to bring that forward that when we're comparing ourselves to South Lake and, and Flower Mound, that although those are perhaps bedroom communities for Dallas, we are a city that's international and that what we do here has an international reach. And if we do it right, that gets around, and if we don't, that's going to get around much farther than anything in Flower Mound or South Lake or, or any of these uh, communities that are perhaps more locally oriented. Um, the potential for Denton, Denton has grown so much. It's 120,000 people now. Ten years ago, it wasn't. And still, half of that population, and always will be, especially given that UNT wants to increase its size, is going to be students, young people, and uh, even, you know, it's very different for me living, growing up in Chicago, living in New York, places like this, to see civil disobedience take on a character that is so tender and so, uh, so gently done and so encouraged <laughs> by those that are, who are assigned to shut it down. And this fragility is um, really part of what needs to be protected here and is so remarkable in what's going on with this ordinance. So if anything, my demand and my solidarity with the citizens of Denton is to pursue an ordinance that South Lake and Flower Mound and these other communities couldn't even touch. So that our ordinance is, you know, defines Texas as an international place for international students and international people, international faculty to be coming to. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Carolyn Hunter, followed by Eamon Danzig. Hi, I'm Tara Lynn Hunter. I live at 804 West Hickory Street, Denton, Texas. I will not be reading you any storybooks tonight, but no. I will be speaking. Um, I'm speaking today in solidarity with these citizens of Denton who are opposed to this weak ordinance and who demand greater protections from a polluting industry. We hold this truth to be incredibly obvious that no person or group of persons has the right to destroy the quality of life for another by poisoning the very things that they need to thrive, air, water, and soil. Currently, Eagle Ridge, Devon Energy, and others are making us sick for the sake of their profits. They're creating a future for Denton where our real estate values will decrease as the public health costs increase. They have deceptively shown up at our meetings from out of town to complain about unduly burdensome regulations, even as our asthma and cancer rates rise from the benzene, toluene, and VOCs that they release into our air every minute. You will come to this vote on this ordinance that is benign in protecting us from, from them. And I feel that a lot of you are probably pretty frustrated um, 
namely with the lack of control you feel you have on a local level um, as comparison to the state and national level. But I think you have to understand that from our perspective as citizens, it seems like you guys are being burdened um, by the threats of an industry suing and um, by just overly burdensome legal advice. Um, and our question is that if perhaps we lived in a richer place like Flower Mound or South Lake, could we maybe afford to be protected? So you can understand our frustrations too. You know, when I saw the people of Pennsylvania light their water on fire, um, I honestly thought, well, gosh, why don't they just move? Like, they've got to get out of there, you know? Um, but now I understand because I've had my house shake. And, you know, I know the cancer rates around here. I've seen the F quality air. I have to carry an inhaler around with me everywhere. That's not something I've, I've ever had to do before. Um, so I understand why people stay because um, this is my home and I can't just move. Um, but when I look at this place and the life that I have here side by side next to the fracking industry's encroachment upon us, um, I do feel a sense of despair. And I've heard that the only antidote for despair is action, and I believe that. So I really respect the people, um, the members of DAG and the members of, of Denton Off Fossil Fuels and other community members who have chosen to push the envelope and do these small acts of civil disobedience. Um, and I, I just hope that you all understand that I think the reason they're doing that is because we need more than three minutes to speak into your lives. We need as much time as these lawyers and as the industry have. Um, and I hope that you know that we respect you and that I believe you are all great people. Um, I will also stand to choose to stand in solidarity with Kathy McMullen, Sharon Wilson, Becca, Adam, and all the countless others who are pushing the bar further and saying, this is only the beginning of the civil disobedience that will come up against the fracking industry. So I'd like to suggest to talk about industrial, um, the yeah, industrial. And I have to ask you to conclude, recognizing you're not going to, but okay. respecting your. I'd like to talk about the industrial zoning. Um, I have a problem with just saying let's industrial zoning, put this in industrial zones because primarily statistically, poor the poorest people and I live you're not in industrial that. zones. And so I'll have to ask to cut off the mic and have you escorted out this time. Thank you. Eamon. Eamon Danzig, to be followed by Laura Abriel. Eamon Danzig, I live at... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine. Uh, I live at 2300 West Oak Street. Um, well, uh, personally, I wonder why you're not all outraged at the fact that uh, we're talking about putting things like benzene, trimethylbenzene, methyl ethylbenzene, known carcinogens, cancer-causing materials that seep out of well gas wells and get into the air into people's lungs that give them cancer, <laughs> as well as up, like 500 other volatile organic compounds that cause illness. <clears throat> there, are people's, there are people with lesions in their brain, not, among, not to mention the fact that we've already talked about people who can light their water on fire. But anyway, uh, the bigger issue here is that you're not going to be able to relegate climate change away from your houses with an ordinance, and that is real. So just so we're clear on the science, I'd like to read from a climate science textbook from the University of North Texas. So what do the current climate situations tell us? The answer is quite a lot, even though some of the numbers remain imprecise. Earth is currently absorbing more sunlight than it is radiating back into space, an energy imbalance of about one part per thousand that is global and increasing. A rise in atmospheric CO2 and to a lesser extent methane is causing the energy imbalance. Human activity seems to be responsible for most of the increase in greenhouse gases, as there are no purely natural processes that can account for more than a small fraction of the increase. If all human generation of greenhouse gases is halted today, there will still be a time lag of several decades to as much as 50 years before the average global temperature stabilizes. Long before then, the Arctic Ocean will be essentially ice-free in the summer. At first, global agricultural production will increase. After an average rise of a few degrees, it will decrease. The distribution of deserts and grasslands will shift, but in ways that are not fully predictable. There is a possibility that the Great Plains could become a huge desert. In Africa, the northern, sparsely populated regions will probably have more rainfall, while the southern, more populated areas will get less. 
Some plant and animal life will expand into newly created environmental niches. Mosquitoes and other insects, for instance, will thrive at higher altitudes, and insect-borne diseases, such as malaria, will thus gain new footholds. Other species will not be able to migrate or adapt quickly enough to their changing habitats and will become extinct. The seas will become increasingly acidic, killing coral and affecting marine animals, which, will, which the entire food chain altered drastically. There are likely to be more tropical storms and hurricanes, chaos theory notwithstanding. Tropical storms will hammer coastlines that presently are not at risk from them or which get them rarely. And there may even be hurricanes in the Mediterranean Sea. Heat waves and droughts will be increasingly common in some regions, increasing health risks and the prospect of more frequent forest fires. Rising sea levels will threaten numerous coastal cities and towns, with some inhabited Pacific atolls virtually disappearing. The Gulf Stream, as well as other parts of the so-called Mediterranean Meridonial overturning circulation will stutter and slow down due to dilution by meltwater from the Greenland ice sheet. It may even stall completely, plunging northern Europe into a deep freeze as other parts of the globe warm up. Thawing of the permafrost in Alaska, northern Canada, and northern Russia will lead to structural instabilities. The shrinkage or disappearance of thousands of lakes, and dis I'm, not, I'm not stopping, and disruptions to fish and game populations. Other, other places will experience violent floods in the late winter and early spring, as highland precipitation that normally falls as snow will instead fall as rain and run off immediately. If, if this is not include. enough to worry about, there are also, there's also another threat. Certain influential leaders who steadfastly, steadfastly ignore the science, as recently as 30, July 30th, 2009, for instance, the former that House- you're not concluding, I'd have to ask that it be cut off and escorted from the podium. Thank you very much. Laura Abriel, to be followed by Rachel King. Hi, my name is Laura Abriel, and I live in 2424 West Oak Street. I am here, um, dressed all in green, uh, representing two things. Um, okay, first of all, I represent a tree, specifically a tree this morning. Yeah, I know this sounds like a tree hugging hippie, and like <laughs> many of the students here. Um, anyway. This morning, we all woke up to a lovely surprise. We all opened our eyes and saw the world we know covered in a beautiful blanket of white, as if someone had come and sprinkled a little bit of magic over the already magical Denton. I personally had to make the very hard decision to get out of bed. <laughs> I chose to get up and take my beautiful dog out to drive to work. I chose to come here and make my voice be heard. I, however, did not choose to breathe the air today. I had to in order to live. I had to drink the water, and I had to breathe the air. These acts were not choices, but you, you all have a choice today, a choice that affects my choices of breathing the air and drinking the water. The ordinance that is being voted on today is not up to par and should be voted against. Community groups just like DAG and Denton Off Fossil Fuels should not be taken for granted. They should be essential in the building of this ordinance. I know you've listened to them, but apparently you haven't been paying attention. I did say that I represented two things. I also represent the color of green. Um, green for 36,000 students, or 3,600 students, uh, 36,000 students, okay, <laughs> at UNT that breathe the air and drink the water that prevent, uh, is provided by Denton. Green for the beauty that is nature nature that has allowed us to, well, be alive. Um, and we take and take and take, and we seem to never give back. You have the choice to give back today, or to at least make a choice to give back later on. Green and support of all the people here who just like you are human beings. We who care for Denton and love the truly unique things that are found here. Green for the money that the city would get from the natural gas industry the money that, unlike my clothes, should not be put over people. I will not be um, abiding by the three-minute rule they have imposed. Um, rules should be followed, but sadly, I'm not the only one breaking the rules. The natural gas industry is right up there. Do you have to escort them out of Denton? Well, you should, but they're not escorted out of Denton. Um, fracking should be so severely restricted that the industry no longer seeks to pollute our air or our water. Oh, geez. This ordinance should have um, these and more restrictions. Um, there should be no new wells or refracking anywhere but, indus but industrial zones. 
There should be a 1,500 foot setbacks from any protected um, uses near industrial zones. Uh, there should be no variances. There should be no compressor stations. There should be no pits, even the ones under the vested rights. There should be no venting or flaring. Um, there should be mandatory reduced emission completions. There should be mandatory pre and post drilling air, water, and soil mon <laughs> monitoring. Uh, there should be mandatory leak detection and compliance plan. Um, I, this is all I wrote, but. <laughs> <laughs> and if you'll conclude, <laughs> I, knew you, I knew that list, so I knew where you were. Um, I just, I, I really do urge you to um, look over the ordinance and to not, to not pass it today. Today, it is not, it is not up to par. It's not safe for us. It's not safe for you. It I appreciate your won't comments. Won't be um, able to and help anybody. That you don't intend to conclude. I'll request that you conclude and, and cut off the mic for that purpose. <laughs> Thank you. Rachel King to be followed by uh, Jason Stroud. Uh, my name is Rachel King. I live at 5301 East McKinney Street, and I have spent the last 16 years of my very young life right here on McKinney Street. Um, I am an aunt of nine nieces and nephews, and although I am not a mother myself, I speak on behalf of Mother Nature. I am speaking today in solidarity with those residents of Denton who are opposed to this weak ordinance and who demand greater protections from polluting industry. Prohibit compressor stations, prohibit venting and flaring, require air and water quality monitoring, strengthen the SUP process, increase setbacks to 1,500 feet, zone drilling and fracking as industrial uses. Being born in Dallas and raised in Denton, um, I cannot express how much I love this city and how much I love this planet that we live on. Um, it, the injustices that we are being that we are experiencing are incomprehensible and um, frankly make me frigid. Um, I was born with asthma and I have suffered ever since. I like others have to carry an inhaler around at all times and I find this to be a personal injustice. I um, I know of no other family member with asthma, and um, and so I have reason to believe that it is directly caused by my environment, which just happens to be Denton, and and I would love to respectfully ask that you create stronger ordinances, so much so that the fracking industry is is pushed and is not allowed to infringe upon my right to to breathe fresh air and to cultivate fresh fruits and vegetables uh, in my own yard and and my neighbor's yard and I want to reiterate that I am standing in solidarity with these fine people of of Denton and the many communities that care so much. I hope that you can stand with us and not against us and that you would vote accordingly. Um, I too am not going to abide by the three minute rule so I will have to be escorted off. Um, you can take the last 26 seconds to stand in silence. Respecting that you don't want to conclude, <laughs> I'll request that you be escorted from the podium. Thank you very much for your comments. Same respect to you. J Jason, Jason Stroud to be followed by Ricar Ricardo Corey. Correa. 
sobre ella. Hey, my name is Jason. I live at 118 Bernard Street. And uh, I don't know. By the time I get up here, I always feel really flustered. Um, you know, I, I every time I feel like I hear a lot of really inspiring, um, creative, beautiful things from a lot of people who are very intelligent and, quite frankly, really have their shit together. And uh, so when I get up here, I'm like, okay, well, I don't really have a whole lot more to say. It seems to have all already been said. But then I realized that we're still here and we're still doing this. Um, so it, it starts a lot of questioning in my head, like, well, okay, so some of you live here. Um, some of you have children. Uh, what's, what are we not getting here? Like, I, I, it really, it makes me very flustered. It makes me um, very sad, um, very angry, and very, very tired of hearing excuses. Um, I feel like after such a long, 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 long process, hearing the same things over and over and over again, being presented very willingly all of the facts, um, Today, like, t today y'all decided to make some changes. And it's weird because a couple weeks ago you were making changes to semicolons. Um, so it's, it's just, it's really odd um, the way that this is working. And at the same time, I think it's, it's very normal. I think this happens all over the place. And I think that's the reason that people do things like come up here and, uh, as you put it, like, not respecting the time of other people, when in fact, I, I think it's just, there's a misunderstanding, it's a tactic. It's a show, it's a display of power. And the reality is, is that we all have power. And I think we live in a place that often tries to tell us that we don't. And um, there are a lot of ways that we're raised, and we sit through a lot of things like this that make us feel very disempowered. Um, but the reality is that we, we do have that power, and we just need to, uh, we need to realize that we have that power, and we need to move forward accordingly. And I think we need to do that very intelligently and strategically. And uh, that's what I'm doing. Um, that's what I'm doing with my life. And I know other people who are doing that, and um, I encourage everyone to do that. And I, I encourage uh, y'all to sit long and hard, um, mostly talking to these people, because we've been talking to you for a long time. And, I'm seeing the results of that. Um, but I would look really hard into climate change and just like the reality of what that really is like and what that's going to be like. And um, I would also encourage you to try to get plugged in to um, a group or uh, a network of people who are trying to make real changes sincerely. Um, I would also ask you all to extend the moratorium. Obviously, we're not done here. Um, also, y'all need to fire George Campbell and Anita Burgess. They're giving you a lot of misinformation. That's, that's and also, I've met with George Campbell, and we talked this out you, you back in the task force days. And he thought it was disrespectful you're, you're for the members of the task force that, that were concluded. members of the I'll have to ask for it to be cut off and be escorted from the podium. Thank you for your comments. Ricardo Correa, to be followed by uh, Tyler Carlton. My name is Ricardo Correa. I live at 117 East Prairie Street here in Denton, Texas, 76201. Um, I am speaking today in solidarity with those citizens of Denton who are opposed to this weak ordinance and who demand greater protections from a polluting industry. I request that the Denton City Council stand strong in defense of the present and future generations of Denton residents. Hydraulic fracking poses a real and scientifically documented threat to the future of our community, to the health of its elderly and its children, to the city's viability as a place where families, communities, and people desire to live. We, the citizens of Denton, 
are not asking for special or preferential treatment. We are simply asking for the same protections that cities like Flower Mound and South Lake have deemed necessary to protect their citizens. We believe that the present and future residents of Denton do not deserve any less than the residents of the aforementioned cities, as well as other communities across our nation. Don't you? Do you believe that Denton residents deserve any less protection than the residents of South Lake? Do you? Will you let your vote reflect that? Or will your vote be a vote of timidity, of half measures, of lip service to your duty to protect the citizens of Denton? The citizens of Denton have worked hard and have done things right and they demand that their elected representatives do right by them. The citizens of Denton have been involved and provided valuable input. They have provided specific and clear demands for the kinds of protection that Denton's gas drilling ordinance must include. These have been largely ignored in the present ordinance. If you vote to pass the proposed ordinance, it will be a slap on the face to the people standing before you. You vote tonight, if you vote for the meek ordinance that is on the table, will be slapped on the face to the people that voted you in and to their children and their loved ones. Major Burroughs, only a few months ago at the draft house, you and many of the Denton residents and activists here tonight had a long conversation, two or three hours perhaps, focused on fracking. Fracking was a central issue in your re-election. And the community expects that your actions tonight reflect your rhetoric from that night. Following that conversation, you, a couple other folks, and I continued conversing. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation, as well as meeting some of the members of your family. In our conversation, I wanted you to commit to putting in the gas drilling ordinance the very same insurance requirements that Flower Mound has in the drilling ordinance. You didn't quite fully promise that. I will grant you that. Uh, because you were worried about legal challenges that may be brought upon the city. However, when I asked if cities like Flower, Flower Mound and South Lake passed these strong protections and were not sued by the gas industry, would you then support nothing less for the city of Denton? And you agreed. Well, no losses have been brought against the aforementioned cities. Will you stand by your word and demand no fewer protections for Denton than for the cities of South Lake and Flower Mound. Now let's look at the forces at play here. On one side, if you, if you, could you have conclude. Uh, I, actually, I will conclude. Perhaps a bit later than you may <laughs> like me to. Um, so, so I figured. On, on one side, you have Denton residents, people who have families and loved ones in our community, the people who voted you in, people who each have been given tens to hundreds. I'll have to request that the mic be cut off and you be escorted from the podium. I do appreciate your comments. Thank you. Tyler Carlton to be followed by uh, Paul Metz Metz Metzler. Meltzer. Sorry. Hello, my name is Tyler Carlton. I live at 1201 Cleveland Street, apartment 14D, 114D. Since all of you know my address, I invite every one of you over for a cup of oolong tea and then a walk around my neighborhood so you guys can see what it's like living near a drill site. You'll then understand why my asthma is worse than it's ever been in my 20 years of life, including when I lived in California. And if you don't come, I assume it's because you don't want toxins entering your body and I accept your admission of defeat. Next, I'd like to apologize to you, uh, Mayor Burroughs, because I actually went to school with your son and I tried paying attention to him over the years with his uh, talks about you and your campaign. But um, I'm sorry because I really missed the part that he said cancer was one of your campaign promises. I really would have loved to know that. Um, and last, I would like to say shame on every one of you sitting up there for uh, calling us out saying we have not explained why this ordinance is weak. We have pre it's been presented to you that we explain to new areas um, with pe where people are moving into new subdivisions that you disclose to them that they may be living where a future drill site is, yet you guys threw that out. We have done the work, we have tried to tell you how we can make this stronger, and yet you guys won't listen and you say we're not doing the work. Until you guys can make an ordinance that may not be identical to Flower Mounds or South Lake, 
but as at least strong enough in some areas that can benefit our city, because we're not the same as them, then you guys aren't doing the work that we've tried doing for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul Meltzer. Yeah, my name is Paul Meltzer. I live at 1914 West Oak Street. Um, I didn't actually intend to speak tonight, but I thought I might offer just uh, some different framing of the issues uh, than I've heard so far. Uh, on our last encounter, I was at the uh, part of the Denton 2030 process, uh, and where we, we talked a lot about the need for uh, Denton to attract and retain a creative class. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, clearly, in the actions taken in something as sensitive as this, you'll be creating a reputation for Denton one way or another that will either help attract and retain a creative class or not. And uh, I think you know clearly there's an opportunity to, by being bold and innovative, show that Denton is a place that should, by virtue of that, be on the map, uh, you know, and kind of be more worthy of consideration as a place for for people in the, you know, in the in that kind of community to to make their homes and 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 livelihoods. Um, in in trying to be progressive and uh, being bold and innovative, uh, you know, rather, and, and I say that's a reframing, rather than seeing how can we kind of accommodate, protect but accommodate, to instead say how can we be bold and innovate, uh, I, I just tonight heard a very simple legal, you know, legalistic idea from the gentleman who re relocated from New Jersey who talked about a wider perimeter around schools. Um, great, add to the list, hospitals, public parks, and these are just sort of not very radical sounding things to say, gee, we ought to have greater protection around hospitals, public parks, senior centers. You could eventually put together a map that, that's pretty difficult to beat, and you know, that, uh, but uh, also uh, very easy to defend. Um, if uh, another just sort of reframing of the issue that I'd like to suggest, you know, I heard that uh, discussion from our city attorney that it's problematic uh, to pursue an outright ban because uh, it you know, would be a challenge to the rights of, of those who hold mineral rights. Um, but in being bold and innovative, why aren't we changing the conversation to the thought that it is problematic to own mineral rights within a city where extracting them is, jeopardizes public health and safety? Let, you know, if there's a problem, clearly that's a problem. And let that be somebody else's legal problem. Yep, they do own those rights, but until they can extract them safely, uh, you know, and with regard for public health, they might be stuck. There, there's, a, there's competing interests. You know, that's that's uh, all I have to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Bonnie Friedman. Hi, um, my name is Bonnie Friedman. I live at 1914 West Oak Street, and I live part of the year in New York City, and I actually feel that my health is safer when I live in New York City than when I live in Denton. This wasn't the case when I moved here, but since the fracking began, I've been worried. I have friends that have cancer, and I know one in eight women get cancer, and I know that the um, benzene that is um, an offshoot of Fracking leads to greater cancer incidence. So when I'm living here, I worry about getting cancer. And it seems to me that certain, you know, I, I, I can't understand. I mean, I'm sure you would worry about that too. Um, it's up to you to safeguard the health of the community. Um, and it seems that, I, I guess I'm, I'm siding with the people who feel that it's hard to balance that with the rights of people who want to, you know, e extract the uh, shale oil. Um, I myself believe that the community would be behind you if you safeguarded their interests, their health interests to the max, and that even if the city were sued, there would probably be a way to raise the funds to defend the city. I know in New York, they are having an enormous fight against allowing fracking. And, and, you know, it seems to me as well that people will move from Denton. I know I've thought about moving from Denton to a community where there are greater safeguards, it, you know, and I think others will feel the same way. I think the value of living in Denton will diminish 
if it is known to be a place full of pollutants. People will not want to move here. People will not want to be faculty members at UNT and live close to Denton if they feel they're jeopardizing the health of their children and their own families. So I, I side with those who say, you know, please um, create an ordinance that, you know, it protects us to the maximum. The community will be behind you. And if you don't, there will be a quizzical attitude of not understanding why there's this disconnect and a feeling of frustration between the people who, who you represent and your own actions. I, I feel that disconnect, and I'm, I'm sure you do too. So, um, you know, I guess that, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And that's all the cards from people wishing to speak that I have, but it is a public hearing, so if anyone who has not spoken wishes to address the council, now's your chance to do so. You can come on up. Ms. Wolper. Thank you. I'm Phyllis Walper. I live at 2616 Hereford Road in Denton, Texas. Uh, one thing I wanted to bring up because it hasn't been uh, spoken of very much, and, it, and when it was, it was kind of as a joke, and that's compression. Uh, in a previous life, I worked for a company that owned uh, the second largest gas compression business in the world and uh, is new to the company and not knowing a whole lot about it. The company sent me out to Houston uh, to go visit some compression stations and uh, uh, be led around by some industry experts so that I could learn about the industry and be able to write intelligently about it in the annual report. And when I went to New York to visit the stock exchange and all that, I would have that knowledge. So dressed in uh, my finest business suit and high heels, uh, I was taken out to a compression uh, station that was, of course, pristine because I was taking photographs for the annual report. Lovely, lovely sight out in the country, way away from anything, I mean miles from the nearest house or anything. And uh, as we were uh, going through this process and they were lecturing me on how it worked and all, uh, I noticed in the, there was a, a large water puddle uh, nearby and just saw these lovely bubbles coming up. And it was, just, it was just fun to watch and they noticed I was distracted by the bubbles and said, you know, hey, fellas, over here, you know, I said, well, you know, isn't that strange, those bubbles over there? The technician that was with us, the number one salesperson for compression in the whole world was standing there, got a look on their face that told me that it might be the day I die. We, he said, is your cell phone on? And I said, no. He said, good. He switched his off. We were taken out there in a vehicle, and he said, I'm sorry to tell you, I hope those high heels are somewhat comfortable. We walked approximately three miles down a country road that wasn't even paved all the way to get away from that site before he would turn on his cell phone and call for a car to come out and pick us up. It was that dangerous of the gas that was leaking from this compression site. Compressors are made to compress natural gas at great pressures to move it through the pipelines. And whether it's a lift compressor at the well site, which is a lesser of a compressor, to the gigantic ones out pushing the big main pipelines, you have got a very, very, very volatile substance, natural gas, with a lot of other chemicals under a great deal of pressure. At any point, when you break a line or something happens or there's a small leak, kaboom. We saw, or you saw in the news, uh, that house or uh, duplexes or whatever it was in Louisville go up. That's from just a minor, minor bling, you know, kaboom. A compression station with large compressors can leave a 30 foot deep <coughs> hole in the ground that sucks in all the air and takes out all the housing and everything around it for acres. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about compression stations. We do not, repeat, do not 
want something like that blowing up in our city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else wish to address the council who has not done so? Please come forward. Uh, my name is David Sanchez. I live at 714 North Rudell here in uh, Denton, Texas. Uh, I, I've lived in Denton for 25 years, and, and I, I really love Denton. Uh, Councilman Gregory was uh, my elementary school principal. <laughs> and so I, I, I remember when he was getting elected, my sister lives in his district. I was like, you know, you got to vote for, for my principal. <laughs> um, but and I, and I really want to thank all of you guys for, you know, for volunteering. I mean, really, I mean, this is what, you know, city councilman and mayor, thank you guys for so much and listening to everybody. Um, I guess I just want to bring a different perspective to it. Um, one thing that I think everyone else also believes in is, is strengthening our schools and, and our uh, and our, and our property values as well. I think something um, that if we bring up, you know, strong, um, I guess, recourse saying that the reason that we're going to have such strong rules against uh, fracking and uh, maybe having compression uh, in our city it is because we care about, you know, our, our, our home values, because we care about the school taxes that are going to be able to, to have great schools in Denton. Because uh, th this this is the kind of city that we have. I mean, we're, we you know we have great education. I mean, I you know I went to UNT. I, I went to to Ryan High School. I went to Strickland Elementary School, and I went to Robert E. Lee. And, and I'm very proud of from where I've come from. You know, I I'd, I'd never want to leave Denton. Uh, I, I want to leave Denton, but I don't want to uh, to move away. Uh, and I just think the people who can move away will move away. I mean. If it, if they're going to be poisoned, they will, which will reduce which will reduce the amount of money that we will have in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in taxes coming in, which which will reduce the amount of uh, funding we will have for our schools as well. So I I think for for us to have a, a solid case that we want to have restrictive policies on on uh, for our citizens, we should have a solid case saying. We care about our schools, and we care about our property values, our homeowners, and our um, and the people who uh, rent out uh, properties as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else wish to address the council this time? Who hasn't done so already? Let's see. Uh, my name is Laura Hernandez. I live at um, 929 West Hickory. Um, when I first came, I hadn't planned to say anything, but I wanted to bring up an interesting uh, something that I noticed uh, recently, I went to a museum in Fort Worth, um, and lots of museums now have uh, energy exhibits. Most of those energy exhibits are funded by energy corporations. Um, so it's lots of fluffed material um, turned into uh, a, an exhibit for kids. Um, there's a, um, I guess, different, um, I guess, monitors where you can drive a truck that's going to um, put, the, put the drill in the ground. Um, and so, I mean, it's, I think it's interesting that that's what's being fed to kids um, by these corporations um, through these museums. Um, and um, I think it also reflects what you've heard um, from people involved in the industry. Um, and so I just want you to be aware of that, um, to urge you to look up your own information and um, not rely on what people are telling you. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to address the council at this time? Anyone else wish to address the council? Then I will quickly go through the cards of those um, not wishing to speak. Probably a couple of folks that actually did, but it's all right. Uh, Mari Metzger uh, in opposition about um, controlling urban fracking as a protection. Uh, David uh, Carlin uh, in opposition to the proposal. I, let's see, are you keeping the citizens of Denton as safe as possible? Um, Milo Kapt uh, Kaplan. Uh, in opposition, Andrea Shriver, opposition. 
Steve Ford, Denton needs regulations as strict as flower mounds, and uh, because the drillers will come here. Uh, Marsha Keffer, uh, prevent fracking. Lydia Alexander, uh, I oppose adoption of the current draft drilling ordinance. Not enough is known about the environmental and health effects of drilling, but uh, the trends show that it's increasing potential for harm. Elizabeth Cowley, in opposition. John Murphy, opposed ending the moratorium due to fracking pollution. Fracking uses, uses too much water, affect droughts. Ed Meyer, um, ordinance needs to be strengthened. Andrew Toll, uh, in opposition, you have been elected to protect and improve the long-term health and well-being of citizens of the community. Sebastian Lurschel, uh, in opposition, protect property values. Rachel Ginker, uh, fracking is dangerous to our health. This is in opposition. Keep us safe. Uh, Jose Jaimes, in opposition. Shannon Beebe, opposition. Stop poisoning land and air. Fracking is not okay. Joy Hawkins, in support of the current uh, draft of the ordinance. S Sarah Nickel, 6A does not go far enough in protecting citizens of Denton. Marie Nichols, the ordinance is not ready for review, requires additional work to be balanced and get a task force that represents the best interest of the public. Maria Sainz, opposition. Christopher Clubunda. I would hope that the city of Denton will consider public health as the top priority, not short-sighted economic gains. Jay McElhaney, encourage the council to consider a complete ban on all gas well operations. Chelsea Sherwood, opposition. Carol Sof, in opposition. I would like council to study more thoroughly the health implications of emissions and impact on children. Jeff Harris was born and raised in Denton and the citizens deserve, deserve the best protection possible from heavy industrial uses like fracking or drilling, natural gas drilling, excuse me. Cynthia McGuire, uh, we should um, apply the precautionary principle. Once uh, this mess is made, it's on the taxpayer to pay for cleanups and the concern about ground surfaces water. Jason Sykes, pay now for litigation with companies or pay later litigation with citizens. The problem will not disappear. Addie Sykes, in fracking. Naomi Meyer, wants city council to make improvements to the proposed ordinances. It does not <coughs> adequately protect the health of citizens with air and water monitoring must be done to ensure the safety of those living in Denton. Lila Amin, I'm strongly in opposition to fracking given health risks. Michael Thompson, more enhanced safeguards are critical within city limits for fracking. Adam Newman, I oppose lifting the ban for fracking because of long-term negative effects on health. Bruce Berg, I request fracking moratorium not be lifted. Mario Aval, Opposition, Ed Sof, please keep compressors uh, stations out of Denton. Please honor and implement DAG's recommendations regarding flaring. It, it's not part of a green completion. And venting, don't let the residents down. We deserve the same protections as South Lake and Flower Mound. Steve Niles, opposition, Sarah Nobles, uh, ban hydraulic fracturing, strengthen the ordinance. Brittany Marie Denoul. As a local farmer, I'm concerned about salinization increase going out uh, where there are hundreds of wells. Debbie T 
Tabawara. It's very important to me that we protect our uh, air and water supply. Not interested in collecting fines when ordinances are broken. Trisha Dealey, need to require air and water quality monitoring. Clearly state in the ordinance exactly what will be monitored. Debbie Tabawara, what are the what are the stricter ordinances that we can impose? Um, question: Get that answer and protect Denton. <coughs> Sanjukta Pukalangara, I am in solidarity with those citizens who are opposed to this weak ordinance and demand greater protection. Dr. Jessica Gulian. Drilling task force has been provided with ample evidence that urban natural gas drilling presents risk for public health. I'm asking council to do everything possible to protect the public health, protect my family in this jurisdiction. Okay. Diane Harris, I am opposed to this ordinance as it's written now. With needs air and water quality testing. Prohibit compressor stations and uh, water restrictions already exist in South Lake. And assuming Denton has water restrictions too, prohibit frac fracking based upon those, at least in June, July, and August. Mark Mogalika. Make the setback for drilling 1,500 feet. I believe Corinth did this successfully. And Chelsea Bakker, when making your decisions regarding the ordinance, please <coughs> remember the industry, uh, let's see, industry does act responsibly when drilling and do not put, let's see, burdensome regulations on these companies because the area has prospered due to drilling for a cleaner green resource. Okay, and those are the cards. I will now close the public hearing. <sighs> Councilmember Roden. I'll start the discussion. Yes. And, and what I want to do for my own sake is kind of clarify, and for everyone else's sake after we've heard all this, where we're at and what we've asked of staff. Uh, one thing that we had mentioned early on, and I guess maybe Darren, you could stand in because some of these questions might pertain to you. Um, one of the things we've added to the ordinance just since tonight is a setback provision relating to compressor stations. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. So that's in the current ordinance. The other thing we've talked about, and I want to make sure that we're clear about our tasking of staff um, is to also take this back and look at it from a zoning perspective to seeing what our possibilities are in addressing that. We've also tasked staff with addressing air monitoring uh, outside of the ordinance uh, and water monitoring specifically to water wells. Um, I'd like to add to that, uh, looking at zoning in its entirety relating to gas drilling and where we allow it and where we don't. We had talked about that earlier in the process and had agreed that it's probably better as we're looking at the DDC in relation to this. Um, even perhaps at the same time we're looking at zoning possibilities for compressor station that we get some sort of feedback from staff relating to that so that we can look at that. I don't think that particular issue has been addressed in several years as to where we allow gas drilling or where we don't or what our possibilities are there. The other thing that we've talked about that I want to clarify and for a future discussion, we currently have about 260 some odd wells in existence that wouldn't come under this ordinance as they exist currently or if they were going to drill there might be some questions of vested rights, whatever. We had talked about the possibility of looking into an incentive program uh, from here on out to address those sorts of wells or even wells that might fall under this where we might come up with a greater list of conditions that are best practices that are perhaps are used in other parts of the country that we can 
devise certain incentives. So if we can uh, address that uh, moving forward uh, as well, those are some of my suggestions. Thank you. Councilman Gregory. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I heard some really good suggestions, uh, especially regarding the compressor stations. And I'm wondering right now, based on um, where we um, have inserted it into the revisions of the ordinance, would the landscaping requirements that we currently have in place for masonry fences, uh, I can't remember the height, uh, and screening and uh, 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 tree planting and things like that, that we currently have for, for drilling production sites. The way that we've done this, would those landscaping requirements and screening requirements now apply to the compressor stations? Under the new definition of what a compressor station is, no. Those are for drilling and production sites. But I think what Councilman Roden was asking is to look at those uh, as a land use through the zoning ordinance. I don't know that uh, subchapter 5 is, is being rewritten, but I think the direction is to look at that in, in landscaping, building design requirements, uh, aesthetics would be looked at then in, in what would be a review of subchapter 5 zoning ordinance. Okay. Another question that I've got has to do with, I've heard several references tonight to insurance requirements. And if we've had that discussion, <coughs> it's happened so long ago that I can't remember it. Uh, so I don't, I don't really know what what we said, or or I would I would like to revisit that that question, and 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 their and the implications of that. And the final question that we may be able to get an answer. Uh, for this. Uh, pardon me, are you asking that from staff as to what it is? Do we have an answer now? We well, do currently have insurance requirements, uh, probably the December 8th review. Uh, some of the requirements were increased. Automobile liability went from 500000 to $1 million. Uh, workers' compensation, again, from 500000 to $1 million for a policy that limits occupational disease insurance agencies. So there were a couple of increases to our current insurance requirements, uh, but there are uh, a lot of general commercial liability requirements in place. A uh, million dollars for single limit uh, coverage of bodily injury property damage. Environmental impairment is, is uh, also included under that. Uh, we have the increase in the automobile liability. Workers' comp was increased. Uh, excess or umbrella liability is $10 million. And control of well is $5 million per occurrence. So there are currently insurance requirements. I do remember some of that conversation now. How do those insurance requirements compare with some of our neighboring cities? I don't know offhand. I know we gave a, a table comparison. I, I don't recall all of them. Uh, some of these numbers, as a lot of cities have mimicked ordinances from other municipalities, a lot of these are taken from other communities. I don't know today how it stands, but I know we gave a table a couple presentations ago. Uh, we can look at that and at least give that comparison back to you. Well, and especially g given the, the, the continued references to um, to South Lake and Flower Mound, if, if we could make sure that those two cities are in that comparison. And then the final question I've got tonight has to do with if you would go back and review for me what our rules are in this draft regarding flaring. As a review, or if you like, I can go over what they are. Yeah, the current requirement uh, is that there shall be no venting or flaring of gases in residential areas except as allowed by the Railroad Commission or TCEQ, uh, the Railroad Commission or uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. And what do they allow? There's a, a permit requirement by the Railroad Commission, and as far as any venting or any emissions, the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality, TCQ, sets the standard as far as what those emissions have to be. Uh, so those two agencies would look to either permit the flare 
or limit uh, the emissions from any vent, uh, any venting event. And um, there were some comments that w a, a, a driller could flare for up to 14 days. Is is that allowed by the Texas Railroad Commission now? It is. I, I, again, off the cuff, I believe it's about 10 days. They, they require a special permit. Uh, but there is an allowance that the Railroad Commission has. They actually uh, require certain permits to, to do flaring activities at a location. Now, given the fact that some of those flaring events, and Council Member Engelbrick had mentioned this a couple of times, uh, based on whatever peculiarities of the equipment or the volume that's coming out, sometimes when that flaring is taking place, he described it as a sounding like a jet engine, uh, that it would probably be in violation of our um, um, noise restrictions. If that's the case, and they're allowed to do it by rule of the Texas Railroad Commission, but as they are doing it for one or two or three or ten days, and they're violating uh, uh, assuming that the, the council member Engelbrecht's right, and I always assume that. Um, um, and please tell him I said that. Um, uh, if they're violating those those uh, noise standards every day, what's what what happens to the what happens to the driller? What what is what's the recourse? Uh, in the ordinance, noise is one of those situations for a violation. It says, in the event of a violation of this subsection, specifically talking in the noise management standards, the city may immediately issue a citation to the operator for the violation. So uh, unlike a lot of times where it's a correctable issue in, in a couple of days, 30 days, or time to cure the, the requirement for noise, and, and as you're addressing something that's only out there for 10 days, the, the city may immediately issue a, issue a citation to the operator for the violation. So that noise level would fall under all the other requirements on this site. So the citation is a fine, uh, if they're found guilty, is a fine of up to how much? It, it is often set by the court. I think the municipal offenses are up to $2,000. Uh, but the fine amount, I'm not sure of what it is. But. So would it be possible, and this may be for a city attorney, to issue a violation every hour or every day or every two days? I mean, it sounds like we may have enough time that we could actually have the municipal court actually convene out there with the jury and listen to it firsthand rather than get a report. How does, it, how does that work? Uh, every day is a separate violation. And so um, the operator could be cited each day of the violation. And I believe we wrote that ordinance uh, as health and safety, and it was up to a $2,000 per day uh, violation. I think we set that at the maximum jurisdictional amount of the municipal court up to that, of course, at the discretion of the jury or the judge. Now, uh, is, is I'm thinking about Council Member Roden's comments about incentives and disincentives. Mm -hmm. uh, it, do, do we have the legal authority to raise that fine limit? Uh, because 2000 a day for a gas well that may be over its life generating $20 million isn't that much money. Uh, I think the $2,000 per day is the maximum amount allowed by state law for health and safety issues. Sometimes we set it lower than that. I've seen the council set some issues at 500, but this one I believe written into your ordinance before you tonight is written at the maximum possible amount of five, excuse me, $2,000. Can I add one item too? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to also refresh your recollection with regard to your direction to the fire marshal and to the uh, city staff as it concerns the writing of that flaring provision. Um, recall that you inquired of the fire marshal as to whether or not ground or you wanted us to inquire of the marshal as to whether or not changing the direction of that flaring was a possibility. We did discuss that with the fire marshal and we have added some additional language in that particular section um, that if it's practicable and if it's approved by the fire marshal, then ground flaring um, that is wholly encased or screened 
with the masonry screen is acceptable. And so we did write that. We heard you. We wrote that provision in the ordinance. Okay, Council Member Roden. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, something else I just wanted to highlight that I don't think has gotten uh, displayed in the public realm unless people have been really paying attention as the changes have happened. And, you know, where we are really talking about setbacks, um, specifically 1,000 feet, which is what's in our uh, ordinance as it stands, it's around things like protected uses. There's remarks about schools and places where kids, we already have a, context for that. We have a whole definition of protected uses. One thing I want to highlight is how much more robust that list has gotten. Currently it's any residence, church, public park, public library, hospital, or school. We've added to that. We've changed residence to dwelling. It's a little bit more all-encompassing, including things like college dormitory, I understand. That's correct, isn't it? We did correct. talk about that. Yeah. And barn dominiums. <laughs> yeah, that's barn dominiums. Yeah, we learned about that. Schools, we wanted to make sure that it addressed things like pre-K or preschools or things like that because it just said schools. So we expanded the definition to include those sorts of things. We added public pool, public transit centers, senior centers, public recreation centers, hotels, and motels because a lot of people congregate in those. So I did want to just point that out for the benefit of the audience that the, what we count as a protected use and we have that setback around just increased exponentially in terms of where drilling uh, is not supposed to happen in town. So take that as you will. I thought that was an important point. Thank you. Councilmember Kane. I would just throw one addition to what Councilman Roden pointed out. Our thousand feet is from the edge of the platform or the edge of the versus the drill hole or the, dr the bore hole. And I guess the other in South Lake. So there's some similarity, so it might be further than some of you are thinking that it is. Just wanted to point that out also. And there's like there's a couple of things that I'll, I'll you know, just kind of rifle through. Is it, based upon the citizen uh, comments, um, I, you know, both air and water quality, we uh, we have um, given direction to to address away a number of people uh, with general uh, statements about um, you know, the propriety of uh, or the strength of the ordinance. The strength of the ordinance really, uh, the, the whole issue uh, has to do with, um, <coughs> in many respects, with air and water quality. We, we have a, a history in the city of being extremely conscious of the air and water quality issues and we, we lead the region in many ways uh, in both those aspects. Uh, and um, in fact, last year we got one of the five best uh, waters in the United States, our city of Denton water supply. So we're extremely conscious and do not want to lose uh, that, uh, that as an attraction because both of those I issues are, are critical. We happen to be in an air shed that is poor and it is poor long before there were any gas wells, uh, one of the poorest in the country. It has improved tremendously in the last 10 years through really horrific type of uh, operations to try to get it that way. M a lot of air quality issues uh, that uh, our primary problem is, tran is transportation, is cars. That, that is the primary pollutant of the air. Uh, it's not the, by any means the only pollutant, but um, we have been extremely active in trying to address, uh, trying to take cars off the road at, and other things that have a very direct impact on our air, air shed. And uh, I have been for the last couple of years chair of our regional uh, North Texas Clean Air Steering Committee, which uh, is charged with that responsibility of finding ways, mechanisms uh, to um, improve our air quality and our state implementation plan. Now whether TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, follows our recommendations has been a separate matter. But we, uh, we have uh, invested a lot of time and uh, attention and expertise in trying to come up with uh, meaningful solutions that, that address those issues because we do care.
care about them. They're extremely high on our list. I personally believe that water availability is the number one long-term threat for the entire Metroplex. And anything that we address with water quality is, is an important, critical issue uh, for our future. And, and so we, uh, we are struggling, as you all know, who have shown been part of this process. Uh, we have struggled for a very long time now uh, trying to find that path to have a uh, outcome, to have outcomes that are meaningful, that result in uh, you know, protection of our citizens and protection of our air and water as, we, as best we can do that. Cities are not given unlimited authority. We're a stepchild of the state. They created us. They allow us to function. They per state regulations, when they regulate, it uh, impacts every time the state makes a statement, it takes away part of what we can say. And that's a very frustrating, as I think a couple of folks have mentioned, they, they see that frustration. Uh, but we want an ordinance that is defensible and that actually nets the result that we all want. And uh, it might not look as clear to some, but uh, I'm here to say we've been struggling trying to find the, um, the correct methodology to accomplish what we are authorized to accomplish and to come out with outcomes that are meaningful. And so um, that has to do with a, a lot of elements. And uh, so we, we have been charged with that responsibility. We have taken it exceedingly seriously. We have spent many, many, many sessions, um, and not just in the public forum. And I, I would make a general statement. A couple of folks um, indicated that uh, industry had more time to speak. That is absolutely false. Uh, industry before this council has had no additional time to speak. They do not get included in closed sessions. They have never been included in closed sessions in, in this issue. So I, um, that is an incorrect assumption or a conclusion that, that some people might have had. But um, I've worked long and hard with Calvin Tillman, the uh, former mayor of DISH, on uh, best practices uh, for the um, gas transmission industry, which we did develop a whole series of best practices, uh, working uh, with a number of governmental entities, Calvin chairing the group, but we had state legislators sitting in on our, uh, our meetings because of what we were able to accomplish, and that was a lot. And I believe that's a very high risk of cities, is the transmission, those pipelines. Uh, the, there was a mention of the Louisville duplex uh, that, that uh, was destroyed, and uh, someone lost their life there. That had to do with a pipeline. That had to do with a pipeline on, uh, that uh, was nearby a, a home, and um, that was, which is a different subject. It's not what we're, uh, what's in front of us tonight. But um, all of these things we are uh, very much vested in and very much are, are um, committed to coming out with a result that is uh, workable, that uh, can stand up, and that we hopefully won't lose what little rights we have at the state, which I can assure you, uh, the rights of cities to regulate this industry at all will be under direct attack this legislative session. And so we need to be uh, mindful of, of um, our power is fleeting. And uh, we, we need to make sure that what we do is just and uh, is, um, it accomplishes what cities uh, are, um, uh, are charged to accomplish. So I've, uh, spewed forth a number of things. I'll let others talk that might want to talk at this time. Council members. <coughs> Council member Watts. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> the insurance issue came up and, and I just, uh, maybe I want just my memory refreshed because in the meantime, I pulled up um, a couple of the other municipalities that have been mentioned there, insurance coverages. H how did we derive at the 
coverage level that we currently have. Um, I think it's a million dollars combined single limit per occurrence. Um, automobile was increased. Uh, umbrella liability insurance of 10 million. The environmental impairment or seepage and pollution says it shall be either included in the coverage or written as a separate coverage, but there's no mention of an amount there. So, um, I mean, this is sort of a new thing that was brought up, and as I'm just looking at it, just curious as to was that something that how, how did we derive at that particular at those particular insurance levels? One of those levels has actually been in place uh, in the ordinance for some time, and if you look back, I I've, I've been here for about two years. They predate me, so the the rationale behind them. I apologize, I can't provide, but I can see that the changes through time in 2005 with the amendments in 2004 with uh, what looked like a complete rewrite, even in 2002 when the ordinance changed, there were ordinance require, or, uh, insurance requirements in the ordinance even back then. And what I've done is tried to compare even historical amounts to those cities and other communities. I, I used to have a similar position for the city of Arlington. We did the same exercise. A lot of those figures mimic what other communities are doing. I, I think what specifically may be mentioned tonight is Flower Mound. Theirs might be a little bit different, but I don't know if they've done a study to, to identify the risk, uh, do any sort of risk analysis to come up with those figures. I don't know that Denton did either uh, a decade ago, uh, but those figures have been in place for quite some time. So if there were an opportunity to look at those numbers and say do they ex uh, exceed or meet the, the risk is acceptable to the city. I think that would be a separate exercise and, and, and something that at least has been mentioned in this type of discussion to do that risk analysis and come up with those figures. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Marodi. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, along, along those same lines, uh, just to clarify for my mind, because I do recall one of our first draft ordinances, we looked at this provision. That which triggered the comparative study. <clears throat> Refresh my memory. From what we saw at the original draft ordinance suggested that came out to us where we started looking at this, from that point after we had kind of asked some questions, moving forward to what we have today in the ordinance, were there any changes? The, the two increases that were previously mentioned from 500,000 to a million, those are changes specific to what's before you this evening. From what we saw in the first draft? Correct. Ordinance? Okay. Correct. That was a, a suggestion uh, by council to look at those numbers, and I, I think Councilmember King actually gave the specific figures and reasoning behind that. Uh, as far as the other numbers, I think the general discussion from my recollection looking back has been to do a study and actually come up with, with more logical numbers as opposed to looking at what other cities have if they haven't done that study. I haven't gotten any input back from Flower Mound that says they have done that kind of study. So I, I think my recollection is that we left that as another opportunity for But in terms of review. what we determined to be the appropriate placeholder, did we go down in some cases from what was on the original? I, I know you mentioned those two, but we didn't, so we accepted no, what was there. Okay. Yeah, those two. I'm just trying to tr track it. Thank you. I have a couple more items too, not from you, <laughs> that, um, to add that I have a lot of notes from what uh, people were uh, were mentioning. Um, someone mentioned about that we should have uh, the ability to notify folks that a well exists. We did put that into our ordinance, uh, our proposed ordinance. Um, and uh, th that was that's an original thing. I don't recall seeing that in other folks' uh, ordinances, but that is something that we uh, developed so that to require um, that there be a uh, recordation of the siting of a well so that future owners or potential owners of nearby properties have the ability to uh, to track that that uh, well that a well exists nearby. Also, future owners of a capped well property will have the ability to find in the records when they're going through a title search that they have a capped well um, because sometimes those are not easy to see and uh, but it could have an impact on future um, future buyers i uh, i would make a note that um, it was raised by a couple of folks about home values 
uh, our direction to staff to utilize the zoning ordinances, in particular with the compression, uh, compressor station limitations, um, that home values is a significant part of the authority to do that. It allows us to zone things like compressor stations if uh, as part of the uh, potential effect on home values interest in what the city has and, and uh, nuisance and other um, abilities of the cities to, to zone for, um, for the protection of the citizens. Uh, also the, um, the green completions uh, item which uh, was mentioned that our, uh, our proposed ordinance uh, included green completions. A whole li a list of what those are and those were derived from an EPA listing of uh, green completions and what how they define them but the EPA put a 2015 implementation date because industry requested it uh, we are not delaying that implementation date we are putting the implementation date now and I would point out that the list of green completion items that the EPA adopted uh, is taken primarily word for word from a list that our region, my North Texas Clean Air Steering Committee, presented to them, to the EPA, with a recommendation that the EPA apply what we developed as standards, when we sent to the EPA, that they apply them nationally, and they accepted them. And uh, as I say, several sections word for word what we sent to them. And uh, we took months and months of developing those, uh, primarily with the help of the city of Fort Worth, who did a very in-depth study, the most in-depth study of the air quality consequences of gas well drilling in our region. Flower Mounds did uh, the, a recent study too. The, the Fort Worth study is, was much more in-depth, and we took a lot of lessons from that study. So it's helped give us the basis for, for uh, what's uh, moving forward with our ability to regulate. Thank you. Councilmember Watts. Mayor, I'm gonna attempt to make a motion with some of these changes and add a couple that maybe have not been discussed here. Um, so bear with me on this. I'll try to keep a summary of what, what we're doing. I wanna point out in the clean version of the ordinance, on the issue with the injection well from a little W to a capital W, that's not reflected in the clean version, so that's gonna be one of the, the changes. Um, I'm gonna make a motion to approve the ordinance with the following amendments. One is the one I just spoke of, um, I think it's 25 or 22.5 point, can't remember exactly which one it is, but the two w, the, the wells going from the small w's to the to the capitals to to take into consideration the definition of the well on the compressor stations um, we've got a setback requirement and we've got a noise regulation i would like to see you know i would like to make a motion that we add to that a landscape requirement and a screening requirement that is the same as what is uh, the oil and gas well pad sites are uh, subject to and if i could clarify on that one that was a direction to staff to add that to, um, you know, what was it not? Or are you talking about in the definitions? No, I, I, I think part of the uh, direction to staff was to consider in a zoning context, right. compressor stations, and, that, and it could be considered then, but what I'm saying is let's, let's, let's add it here, and then if we need to make changes to it when the zoning issue comes up, just so that we'll, I don't think anybody's going to be throwing a big compressor station out there anytime soon, but if we do, I would at least like to have some of those protections in place. Okay. Um, so that's screening? Screening and the landscape requirements. And the, landscape the, the, requirements. The, the landscape and screening requirements that currently are applicable the, to drilling operations. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Um, well, no, he's saying that whatever the landscape and screening regulations are applicable to the drilling operation pad sites, those same regulations will apply to the compressor stations as, as defined. Um, I'm gonna make a motion to increase the setback to 1,200 feet. And my rationale for that is we have a 1,200 foot setback from the flood impingement of Lake Ray Roberts and um, Lake Louisville. So it's not the 1,500 feet that everybody wanted I personally am, am, am okay with uh, 
that, that increase. Um, I would like to see the insurance coverages changed. I, I think when we talked about, I think I got confused with the insurance coverage or the bond requirements. I believe we had a discussion about the bond requirements that on some smaller operators, you, they can't go out and get a letter of credit, so they've got to put up the cash, but that's a different surety than, than these general liability insurance requirements. So I would like to change the insurance requirements to make a motion to change those to coverage on the general liability insurance from a million to five million. Simple fact is, being a business owner, uh, I carry uh, more liabil general liability insurance than a gas well operator at this point, and, and I, I mean, I certainly want to take care of my residents, and, and I think we, I think that's going to be um, not that too onerous. The, the environmental impairment or seepage and pollution. I'm not sure exactly how that needs to be handled, except I think there needs to be some coverage there equal to the commercial general liability insurance. So if it's a separate policy, five million, if it's included in the commercial general liability insurance, that needs to go to 10. On the excessive umbrella liability insurance policy, currently it's 10 million. I would feel more comfortable with that being 20 million. Um, oh, I'm on page 35, I'm sorry, of the clean version. Page 35, uh, required insurance coverages. Yes, I will. He asked me to start over on that. Uh, on page 35, under required insurance coverages, 1A goes from 1 million to 5 million. B has a coverage limit of 5 million, which it has no coverage limit right now. And I'm sorry, I'm back on 1A, if environmental impairment is not a separate policy, but is included in the commercial general, general liability insurance, that would be 10. Uh, the Excessive umbrella liability insurance from 10 million to 20 million. Let me take a look at my notes to make sure we've addressed the air monitoring and the water monitoring, which will be done through the department. Those are the the items that I have, and I certainly would entertain uh, friendly amendments, but also reserve the right to not accept them. So that's my motion. Uh, we have a request for clarification. Um, if Mayor Pro Tem Camp does. Go ahead. I I'm think just, he has a direct I'm just, response. I'm just going to clarify the insurance. I think you would achieve what you're looking for by leaving the general liability at $1 million and making the umbrella $24 million. Okay. You're the insurance that's, expert, so I will certainly <laughs> defer to know, you. I don't know if I'd vote for that, but that's to clarify that. Understand. That's how you would actually Understandable. Find. Yes. I, 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 I appreciate yeah. that. If you, want to, if you want to achieve $25 million, you buy a $1 million general liability and a $24 million umbrella. Okay. And I, I, I can accept that. Okay. You bet. Okay. Now, Mayor Pro Tem Camp. Okay. Yeah. First, I, uh, Chris, I appreciate your list. I was checking <laughs> things off as we went. I guess my question would be any clarification that we need from legal at this point. I mean, can can we make the motion and include uh, everything that we just added? Uh, absolutely. We will uh, go ahead and incorporate whatsoever you choose in the ordinance pursuant to your motion and um, uh, make some adjustments to it at, at your direction. It's not a problem. Okay. I, I guess the other thing that I'd like to say is uh, obviously this has been a, a very long process. It's been a very public process. Uh, there are some statements that have been said tonight um, that quite frankly were very wrong. Um, every single member on this council cares very much for the city and every citizen in it. We all live here. Quite frankly, I was born here. Okay? We care very much. And quite frankly, uh, we're pretty emotional about it too. This has been a long, difficult process. Uh, I want to thank all of you for talking to us. I think that we listened to you. We gave, uh, we gave you respect when you spoke to us. Um, uh, some of your ideas I think are wonderful. 
Some of them were just erroneous. I, I think we all do that. But I'd like to thank uh, Adam, you also, and the DAG in your process. We all learned quite a bit by working together, and uh, we made changes. We made changes all along. We made changes last week. We made changes tonight. Not everyone is going to get everything they want in this process. Neither side is going to. It is not possible. But what you need to keep in mind is this, we are much, much stricter than it was. I think this is going to prove to be a model for other cities also. We've made so many of the changes you've asked us to because we've wanted to. Um, I, we're going to review it. This is not the end all. We'll see what happens. Um, I, they are stricter standards. I think that we're much closer together. I just appreciate all the citizens and everyone that's had anything to do with this process. We do appreciate you coming and talking to us. We truly do. Thank you. I'm, I haven't addressed that yet. I was going in order that they popped up. <laughs> uh, and I believe the uh, council member Roden was the next one up to do with the second. Thank you, Mayor. I was just going to second the, emo uh, the motion by Councilmember Watts as amended. Okay, and Councilmember Gregory. Thank you, Mayor. And I want to uh, speak to the amendments and uh, particularly in support of the 1,200 foot setback. Um, I, I think that we have an opportunity to do better than the 1,000 foot. I like the 1,200 foot. I think I would even like the 1,500 foot. Uh, it seems that that also that maybe that that I, council member wrote I don't know if I want to expose you or not but you checked the <laughs> the uh, Louisville or the flower mound ordinance and apparently theirs is 1500 foot from the perimeter not from the wellhead uh, so it's a little bit different from what we thought but I think 1200 feet is an improvement over what we have and we're trying to improve the ordinance uh, it is consistent with with um, with the setbacks required by the federal government uh, for um, our flood uh, pool for Lake Louisville and Lake Ray Roberts, and I think that the protected uses are uh, as as worthy of protection as the flood pool. Um, so uh, I feel like that it's that it's reasonable and it's defendable. And, uh, and it doesn't push us to the maximum, uh, uh, but, it, but it makes uh, an improvement over what we have right now. Thanks. Council Member Watts. Thank you, Mary. I just, I just want to take just a, a moment to, to say that how much I really appreciated the public input, how much I appreciated DAG's work. I mean, you know, I've seen people say that we haven't listened, and I've been on council for six years, and outside of the Fry Street issue, that first came up when I was on council, I have not seen any more information on a particular issue from all different perspectives and all different sides, which I believe has helped me uh, formulate uh, the opinions that I have based upon the information that I received. And I believe the process has worked. There's been some criticism of the process, and I understand that, and everybody's entitled to, to their opinion on the process. But in the end, we, we've taken information that not everybody has agreed upon, and we've tried to craft something that can meet the needs of our citizens, all our citizens. So I appreciate all the, the hard work. I appreciate all the differences of opinion. I appreciate all, all the scientific articles that have been emailed to all of us because I've read nearly every one of them. The video that, that was shown this evening, I reviewed that this weekend. Um, and, and let's be clear that this is, this is a, a moving document, and somebody suggested to look at it in five years. I probably would say it needs to be a little bit sooner than that, um, you know, maybe even on a yearly basis or, or an 18-month or two years because these things change quickly. And so I have appreciated all the hard work. Yes, um, I, I care about the citizens. I wouldn't be sitting up here for six years if I didn't and listening and reading all the information. I don't know if you know, some of you do, but we got delivered a box of a probably, I, I don't know what, 2,000 pages 3, or something? 3,000 3, 3, pages um, uh, Saturday to wade through. And, and I appreciate the minority report for the task force. I think reviewing that was very helpful in trying to craft some things that would really try to meet some of those needs and interests. We really tried to 
find common ground in this regard. So, and I appreciate all my colleagues' hard work on this and the input. Um, so, I, again, thank everyone, and, and we'll just see how this, this vote comes out. Um, I know Councilmember Gregory wants to talk again, but uh, hey, everyone else gets a chance to, to talk uh, in row, and, and um, I'd like to throw in a, a, additional um, thoughts on the motion and, and such. Uh, I think that um, this has been not a labor of love, but a labor, labor of necessity. Uh, I think that, um, you know, it's an interesting path we've taken. Denton was the first city in North Texas to pass a drilling regulation at all. And uh, we, we, again, we, um, we did create that when the Ropes and Ranch development came in. And uh, times changed, and uh, we have uh, weighed in where um, perhaps uh, you know, some might not wanted us to weigh in. Uh, you know, if the Railroad Commission, which is the primary regulatory authority of the state, were to have its way, the setbacks would be 100 feet. And, um, and so bottom line is uh, we have long recognized that drilling as a, an endeavor is a, an industrial use that is um, uh, problematic in most areas of a densely populated city. Uh, the, um, there are certain realities that we had to, uh, had to face in order to uh, recognize what we can defend. And I think we have worked really hard to, um, to uh, chart this uh, dangerous course, uh, this regulatory course, this authority course, and try to address the, um, the substance of what we needed to address. And uh, I think that what is, um, what is being proposed, uh, far from being perfect, is, is as strong as, as uh, I believe um, we can go at this moment in time with the direction of the staff on the, uh, the testing of our air and, and water. And w I think we will, um, uh, we will have revisions in future. We need to. The industry is changing. And hopefully there will be breakthroughs that will allow for uh, further regulatory involvement of, of cities and that if the state allows us to do that. And I would request all of y'all with equal vigor to <coughs> communicate with state legislators now because they will be considering this. And what we do today isn't going to be worth the paper it's written on if the state decides to intervene and take this authority away, the authority that we do have, and they can do it. So, uh, and there are folks out there that really want them to do it. They need to hear from citizens, our state legislators. So please, I encourage you to take that step. Take the time to do that. It is worth it. So um, I appreciate that. And Councilmember King, have you spoken to the ordinance yet? Uh, Councilmember King first and then Councilmember Gregory. Well, I would. Uh this has been an interesting and a long process. I think the, uh, our phase one was my first meeting. <laughs> and uh, I'm so glad that we're not doing it between 3.30 3 a.m. and 4.30 a.m., which is when we did it at my first meeting. I mean, that all said by itself was just a tad exhausting. And, uh, but I want to thank everybody for working on it. I, you know, my goal, all the way through was to have something workable and defensible. And I don't know that we totally had that, but it sure has had a lot of input, some of it to last minute, and some of it through the process, but it has been arduous at best. So uh, thank you for your patience. I don't think we're the enemy, but I realize we're the people that you get to talk to. So uh, with that said, <laughs> I'll hush and let, let Dalton have a moment. And Councilmember Gregory. Well, I, I, along with words of appreciation, I, I want to make sure that that we appreciate the staff. That that there was a lot of work and a lot of last minute work and a lot of changes, and we've asked, demanded for a lot of backup and information, and you guys have done it with with uh, speed and with grace. Uh, 
I appreciate council members who have differences of opinion but maintain a really great level of civility. And, and I am particularly appreciative of Mayor Burroughs. Um, you, you handled uh, and presided over what could have been um, something pretty unpleasant with, with um, patience, with civility, and with grace that I certainly couldn't have mustered. And, <laughs> and I, I very much thank you for that because you helped set the right tone to, for us to move through the hearing. And um, uh, kudos to you for that, sir. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I do respect what the citizens here had to say and how they said it. I think they did uh, recognize that it was a, a it was a means to get attention for something that strikes to the heart, and uh, I recognize that. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded and is before us. Um, do you have sufficient uh, direction to? Uh, have the modifications as um, as described? I do, ma'am. Then if there's no more discussion, seeing none, uh, let's vote on the board for the ordinance as amended, as stated from the council dais. And that motion is approved five to one. Okay, we are at the next item on our agenda. Citizen reports, there are no citizen reports that have been listed on the agenda. Therefore, we are at um, new business and announcements. And Council Member Roden. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to invite everyone out. This is uh, the Denton community's time this weekend to celebrate MLK Day. Mm -hmm. And so on Saturday, uh, the community is getting together out at uh, Fred Moore Park to do a cleanup from about 10 to noon. That will be followed by a, uh, a meeting with speakers and music at the MLK Center at noon for about an hour. Uh, then again on Monday, there's the community march. Some folks actually start at UNT around 3.30, 4-ish, come all the way. There's a march that picks up at the uh, Fred Moore Park. Um, and then that's going to take us to the MLK Center where again we'll be celebrating the life of MLK and his legacy But that all takes place uh, on Monday. So uh, check the website for more details on that Very wonderful And I'll say I, I wish I could attend the MLK proceedings But I'm going to be in Washington DC at the inauguration It's my great privilege to have gotten an invite to that so I will be doing that with my family so um, any other new business and announcements? Thank you all for your participation, your patience, and your heart. And we are, oh, Councilmember King, did you oh, have something? I would like to mention the Your Beautiful Luncheon. It's, I guess, Friday week, and it's about and against cancer, which is just a terrible blight in our society. And the reason I'm mentioning it is because we were sponsoring in honor of a friend of mine that as of last week, will be in memory of a friend of mine, Julie Debolt, sweet lady, passed away with cancer last last Wednesday, and we uh, had her uh, graveside service this afternoon before I got here. So uh, it's terrible, terrible blight on our society, and 